This episode is brought to you by Coifin. Coifin is one of the fastest growing platforms for financial data and analytics to research stocks and understand market trends. Imagine a Bloomberg Light with tons of high quality equity and macro data, a powerful graph engine that can show it all clearly, and a user interface that doesn't look like it was built in the 1990s. If you're an individual investor, research analyst, portfolio manager, or financial advisor, do yourself a favor and check them out. You won't regret it. Sign up for free at coifin.com. That's K O Y F I N.com. Hit it. It's Friday, November 12th, 2021, episode 156. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome to the show Leslie Harris. We have a terrific discussion about his career from his early days at the Comex to life on the Greenwich Capital desk with our good friend Morris to his latest venture as an executive coach. This is one conversation you don't want to miss. And then finally, our Lord of the Crayons, Patrick Serezna, answers the question (laughs) on everyone's mind. How does his voodoo magic deal with daylight saving time changes? We end with our segments of no stupid questions and skin in the game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. we got a great show. Lena, hop on. What beer are we drinking this week? So this week we are drinking Babe Tangerine Dream Lager by Jasper Brewing Company. All right. So this is, a, this is the last one of the Alberta pack. And I thought it was very fitting because, you know, the old saying, bulls and bears get, uh, bulls and bears make money, but pigs get slaughtered. But... But this uh, uh, tangerine dream is, uh, it doesn't sound oh my like. God, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me give you the spiel about the beer. <laughs> a follow up to the smashing success that was the Babe Blueberry Vanilla. That's a very interesting beer. Uh, the tangerine lager is a citrus commotion that, commotion that goes down like water. Smooth and effervescent. You can never go wrong with a cold one of these. But sounds like someone did go wrong with one of these. I don't know. <laughs> It's way uh, too orangey. It's to me, it's sweet. It's, I mean, uh, it's in it's, the name, tangerine. I guess so. And I guess it's it's living up to its thing. It's, it's listen. It's got a great logo. It's a good. It's a good bottle, but um, it's too sweet for me. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, uh, but uh, Lena, do we have an announcement on the merch store? Well, some people were uh, concerned about our catchphrase "Don't Goocher it" because apparently Goocher means something else sometimes. Yes. So we've also added a couple more merch <laughs> items that don't have the phrase and just the logos for those of you that are a little bit too shy about our catchphrase. But you can find all that merch stuff at markethuddlemerch.com. Oh, there you go. All right. Well, give us do, a disclaimer. Do, do, do we have to look that up in uh, Urban Dictionary to figure out what you, you can You can do that on your, on your own time. Okay, we'll do that. Let's not talk about it on the air. <laughs> Side effects. Nothing in this product, podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include male pattern insecurity. <laughs> That's a Jeff Bezos <laughs> problem. Shorting Tesla dis- disposition, also known as an STD. <laughs> I had to go to the doctor for that one. And the prop trade poops. <laughs> All right. Let's get to the interview with Leslie. It's our great pleasure to welcome to the show a seasoned, professional, journeyman trader, and just a terrific all-around guy, Leslie Harris. How you doing, Kevin? (laughs) It's great to have you on the show. And I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And I just would like to let people know how I got to know you a little bit was that I kept hearing our good friend Morris Sachs talk about on his podcast this fabled, you know, just really smart trader that it was long all these stocks and giving him great advice and i said to boris i said you have to make the introduction and would he be willing to come on our show you know the reason how morris connected to you because i am a paid subscriber to the macro tourist uh, mm-hmm. great great site and i sent morris some of your work and then he you know subscribed and you know he's got a little time on his hands and from what i understand got a little busy in uh in the comment section and then, you know, went on your podcast and, you know, killed it. And then, you know, one thing led to another and now he's got a podcast. So. Uh, I was just interested that Morris knew somebody that was actually long stocks. Well, you know, it's, 
it's a bit of bone of contention for us. We can address that later. We we have a we have a, a different belief system around stocks. You oh, that's know? right. Uh, so, Leslie, let's jump into your life a little because when you were explaining to me where you're from and your background and how you evolved to this stage of your career, I was shocked. You were actually one of the few people that lives in New York, but is actually a New Yorker. I yes, I grew up in Queens, New York, and raised my family. Uh, in Lower Manhattan, uh, got married, raised with my family in Lower Manhattan, and currently I live in Brooklyn. By the way, and, oh, you, uh, you've moved off the island. Moved off the island, and I know this is the drinking part of the program. So I just want to say that representing Brooklyn tonight is three brew, threes brewing logical conclusion IPA, seven uh, percent ABV, <laughs> and according to the tasting notes, ripe peach gushers, fluffy wheat. Coniferous, which I had to look up, which is something to do with like pine needles that's and correct. white minerals. Yes. Yeah. So that's what I'm drinking. And uh, full disclosure, in addition to that, I have a bottle of Springbrook Adirondack straight rye whiskey, just in case I get lose my focus. <laughs> um, and this is made, uh, according to this, handmade in the Adirondack Mountains with pure, unprocessed spring water. I believe it's up near Lake George, which I think it's near Canada. I don't know where that is. I, I don't know where Lake George is, but uh, you are a perfect huddle guest. You come equipped with not just your own beer, but also some spirits. I love it. And uh, the Brooklyn, have, are you now that you've moved over to Brooklyn, are you growing a beard? I did grow a beard <laughs> over COVID. I had a really big beard, and my wife hated it, and I recently cut it off. So now <laughs> I'm sort of, uh, and not for one moment did I think it made me look better or more handsome, but I enjoyed <laughs> having it. Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit about you grew up in New York. Uh, I grew up in New York. To university and- I went to New York University in upstate New York, and that's not code for Cornell. I went to the State University of New York at Binghamton, and uh, after college, I, you know, when growing up, I worked in, uh, since I was like 15, I got my working papers, what they're called working papers, and I worked in uh, catering halls and banquet halls and hotels and um in college, I, I worked in restaurants and I was a bartender for a while. And uh, I really loved that work. And when I finished college, I didn't go to Wall Street. I decided I wanted to work in the restaurant business. And um, I actually ended up running a restaurant, a 92-seat restaurant. And I didn't run it. I helped run it in Greenwich Village. And what I discovered after a couple of months at working in a restaurant and running a restaurant are two very different things. Working in a restaurant can be fun. Running a restaurant is terrible. <laughs> and in addition to that, it's a terrible business. You know, once you start getting, looking at the books, it's like, it's amazing that any of these folks make any money. It's mostly a hobby. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, you know, you could set money on fire or you could open up a restaurant. It's sort of the same thing. Uh, so this is probably just to give context. This is probably like 1981. 1982, not a great economy, not a great job market. So I don't know what I'm going to do. So I, I think about, oh, I'm going to go work on Wall Street. I have no idea what that means. I mean, zero. I, I don't, you know, I'm not a well-connected guy. My dad has a stockbroker, and from what I understand, not a very good one. Uh, so I kind of, you know, hit the pavement for a while. And then, funny enough, I get a job offer at a Frankenstein firm called Shearson Lehman American Express and uh, a mouthful. And uh, I get a job in what, what was called a, like a back office training program. And I think because I had a college degree and I said I would do anything, you know, they put me in the back office. And at that point in time, there weren't a lot of people with college degrees who said they would do anything and work in the back office of a retail, what was called a wirehouse. So I go work in this, um, and I'm very grateful. I, you know, I, I'm very grateful. I, I show up every day and have my little sandwich, you know, work very hard. And it's sort of interesting because I get through, uh, what they're doing is sort of rotating you through different parts of the back office. So I go to the margin department. I learn how to be a margin clerk. It's sort of interesting, you know, figure out how all this happens. You know, I go work at, you know, the delivery for payment um, part and, I have to, you have to imagine this is the early 80s. This is pre automation And, you know, the reams of paper and just the, the clerical staff is overwhelming. 
And I even get to work in the cage. You know, you ever heard of that expression before? The yeah. Cage? So, uh, you know, when I went to high school, I actually got a job delivering bonds. I used to go, go to school. Oh, so morning. you know exactly what I'm talking I about. I know exactly. We used to actually physically deliver all the bonds. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, these are for the listening audience. You know, if you heard the expression clipping coupons, like the cage was where they clipped the coupons. And, you know, the bonds there were bearer bonds. So, you know, bearer bonds paid to the bearer. So they were like cash. So you have like tens of millions of dollars, you know, sitting around. So they couldn't do that. So they built a cage around the, the, the desks. And that's what we did. So I did that, which was like, I, I thought that was still to this day, one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Um, so I'm down there doing, doing this. It's on lower, lower Manhattan, you know, Wall Street area. And one of the kids on the training program with me one day says to me, um, hey, I got a friend on the commodities exchange. You know, we can get on there if you want, you know, during lunch and, you know, get a tour or get a walk around. I said, sure, whatever. So we go down to uh, the floor of the commodities exchange. AKA was it the NYMEX or the COMEX? This was the COMEX. Okay. I think I, I took the NYMEX existed but the comex was where it was at oh that's fact, right because it was the gold era it was the gold the- right so i will get to that in a second and it's funny that you should say that because the i we were in the gold area so I, we got we tour those silver and the gold uh rings and uh the nymex at that point was where like the the gold brokers and the silver brokers like sent their shitty brother-in-laws to work <laughs> you know i like oh you know you can't work with me but go go with that little ring over there in the corner and just behave yourselves so um, I go down to the Comex and I'm, I'm there and it's literally like, you know, in the Wizard of Oz, you know, when Dorothy lands and it's all black and white and she steps out of the door and it's all color. And it's like, <laughs> That's a great analogy. So, like For me, it's like, oh, Wall Street is the cage or Wall Street is this. You know, I want this. So I, I'm literally bowled over. So I go home that that day. And I figure, like, how, how do I get from here to there? And I, I'm not, I don't know anybody, but I start calling anybody I know. As it turns out, my brother-in-law knows a guy who's sort of in something called commodities. Call him. So I call the guy, and he says, I can't help you out, but there's a guy on the floor named Eddie. This is a number. Call Eddie. You could use my name. So I call Eddie. He says, I'm not hiring anybody, but if you want to come down, come on down. So I meet Eddie after the close one day, and as, I don't know this at the time, but it turns out Eddie is running uh, the floor brokerage operation, the largest gold floor brokerage operation on the Comix. Oh, wow. And he works for a guy named Charlie. It's Charlie's company. Eddie runs the operations. So I go talk to Eddie, and uh, he looks me up and down, and I give him the, you know, I'll do anything. I don't care. You know, I just put in the door, you know, the whole... You know, I'm 23 years old. I'm saying everything I could, doing everything I can. So Eddie says to me, well, we're not really hiring, but I can hire you as a runner, but I can only pay you $225 a week. So I said, and by the way, you know, as they say on another podcast, if that sounds like not very much money, trust your instincts. It's not a lot of money, even in 1981. So I say, of course, yes. And uh, he then takes out an order slip and writes uh, all the months down. Yeah. He writes, you know, F for January, G for February, H right. for March, and he writes them down and goes, show up like a week from Monday, make sure you know what all these letters mean when you turn up. Okay. So I do. So here I am, you know, a runner on the exchange. So what's a runner do? So a runner's job is to sort of take orders from what's the booth where orders come in, bring them out to the brokers in the ring. Big orders go to Charlie, medium or if market orders, big market orders go to Charlie. Medium market orders go to Bobby. Small market orders go to Greg. Small out of the mu- small orders and uh, back month orders go to Jaycon, who's sort of below the below the the ring. And by the way, for a distinction, you know, for all you folks in Chicago, it's the pit in Chicago. It's the ring in New York. Ah, just, I didn't know that. Okay, so okay. just so there you go. You learn something every day. <laughs> so and uh, and then. There are all these ARB clerks, and the ARB clerks put in their orders like verbally, so they shout them into the bro- to the brokers, and you got to take their tickets after they shout the order and give them to recognize where that order, which broker is executing, get that order over there. Now, in addition to doing that, 
um, one of also one of your jobs is to sneak food onto the floor for the clerks. <laughs> and it, the comics had a very interesting policy. It was almost like a don't ask, don't tell policy. Like if you got the food onto the floor, they were okay with it as long as you weren't brazen. But you know, like they stopped you at the border, you know, like getting in. So, and the only reason I bring this up is not to be glib or to be funny, but it was very important. And it's a, because here you are, you're 23 years old, you know, to say you don't know jack shit about the markets or about anything is, you know, like the cliche, it's like an insult to jack shit. <laughs> and, um, but let's say Joe M who's like the lead arb clerk, really smart, really clever, likes a bag of combos at 10 30 in the morning. Cause he's feeling a little peckish and you can get him that bag of combos Combos are like a little, like a snack, right? Right. And, well, then maybe Joe M's going to sort of, on a quiet time, say like, hey, you know, that's J.P. Morgan's broker. That's Lowell Mintz's broker. That's Jay Aaron's broker. You know, uh, that guy's, he's the Drexel broker. He's just making a lot of noise. He's trading his own account. He's got no paper behind him. <laughs> that clerk across the way, he's got a tell. You know, when he puts in an order that's a big order with 50 or 100 lots, this is what he always does. And that's valuable, or like like I like to say, and these are real people. You know, Freddie likes a turkey sandwich. Well, okay, you get Freddie's turkey sandwich, maybe he sort of explains to you how to check out the business and maybe introduces you to Milty's clerk because if you have an out trade, you got to go to Milty's clerk to sort of get that sorted out. And this becomes very, very valuable, you know, and this is how you learn what's going on. Like in today's world, they would call it, experiential learning and senior level sponsorship. But back then it was like how you learned the business and how you learned what was going on and how you learned how to get along. And it all depended right. on you sneaking in combos. Exactly. And you know what? Not unimportant, not insignificant. And the folks who sort of bitched about that, you know, found, you know, found jobs at, in accounting later on. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I, I fulfill my my duties as a as a um, you know as a runner. And again, you know, I want to digress for a moment. So, like, this is like a real community where people really are passing on knowledge. You know, I have to tell you, like, there were many afternoons over the years where, you know, particularly early in my career, I ended up at Eddie's apartment with a bunch of other clerks, and we would like we would drink beer. By the way, Molson Golden Lager, believe it or not, really. Believe it or not, oh. yes. And um, you know what we do is like we turn on the weather weather channel with the sound off and drink Molson Golden Lager. A couple of people had other recreational stress relievers, okay. and um, you know we would break down the day's trading like an NFL coach or a basketball coach would break down film. We go through the entire day's trading at the end of the day, and I, and I just. I, I can't stress enough how informative and how um, how important that was as, as a young person sort of figuring out the markets and that kind of knowledge that's being sort of, I won't say passed down, but just sort of having the ability to talk about the markets and break them down, you know, what's happening in the back months, why, you know, go through the brokers trading, what were they doing, why did things shift? And we do that for a couple of hours. I mean, it may sound nerdy, but it was it was invaluable. Well, I, and I just I have to put that out there. In no, the that's world. fascinating. And and uh, back then there wasn't a lot of ways to get that information. No, there was no training program. There was no nothing. Right. There was, and there, there's no Twitter people talking about no. it. There was no podcasts. And that's you know one of the things that you gonna people... listen to Lewis Rukeyser on Wall Street <laughs> Week on Friday night. Like what? <laughs> like what the fuck is that going to do for you? But this was real stuff. Right. So. So I do, I, you know, I do my job as a, as a runner very well. And I sort of, over time, I get promoted to the guy who is, um, it's called holding the deck. So I'm holding the order book um, behind Charlie. I, I, I need to pause for a second and talk about Charlie. So Charlie owns a company. Uh, you know, let's just put it this way. Fuller of the Commodities Exchange, gold brokers at this point, these are real alphas. And Charlie is a super alpha. And I'm not saying this because I'm trying to puff him up or anything. 
he, besides running the biggest operation, he's one of the two largest individual traders on the, on the COMEX. And I say that because his geography in the ring is such that he's top shelf, meaning all the big guys on the top as it goes down and gets lower. But now he's on the top shelf. He's got a little piece of real estate with a little um, railing, which is something he put his trading cards on. And he's sitting, he's standing, excuse me, to the right of the COMEX reporter. Now, what does that mean? So that's the guy who's sort of supervising the chaos for the exchange. And, um, you know, also means that if a print goes up that Charlie doesn't like, he gets to look at that guy in the face and tear him a new one. And so why don't you just I, explain to people when they say prints? Because now – print, I'm sorry. Let's yeah. say so, uh, you know, the prices are prices are moving live in, into the um, – in the exchange, it's an open outcry. It's all that kind of stuff you've seen in the movies and stuff. But you know, the as it goes on, the Comex reporters are reporting prices that are trading, and they're going on what's a big board, which is a you know a, a price board uh, all around uh, the rings, all around the exchanges. And let's just say, uh, for example, three eighty. Someone has a buy stop at three eighty five, meaning an order to execute at three eighty five. And the 385 print goes up there. That's that stop needs to be executed because it printed by virtue of the exchange. But there's a little leeway if that is maybe the top and how much trades up there. It's it's not a science. Right. So and so, and then being so, so close to it, he could influence it if it, if he needed to. I, I'm not. I, no, no. I listen. No, we all understand. Right. So <laughs> you're sitting there, and you know. Or more importantly, like in the back months where, you know, the like, so let's say spot is February, the February month, you know, August is trading, June's trading, Geese is trading. And those prices are, they're not that liquid. And those are sort of, there's a little bit of flex, flexibility in how those get, get printed. So, uh, so that's Charlie. And Charlie is, like I said, he's one of the, the guys. And coincidentally, because this will come up later, his best friend, and his partner in a different business, in the clearing business, is sits stands to the left of the Comex uh, reporter. Okay. And these are the two two guys. I mean, there's a lot of guys, but these are two guys. Uh, so I get my I get the lovely promotion of getting to hold the deck. So the deck is the order deck, uh, which is basically sell orders and buy stops above the market, uh, bids and uh, sell stops, uh, buy stops and sell orders above the market. Uh, bids and uh, sell stops below the market. But because nothing is obvious, like also your job is to make sure Charlie has enough pens and, uh, you know, big pens, the ones you buy 50 at a time with the caps on, and you got to make sure his trading, trading cards are up. And Charlie is a pretty aggressive fellow. So besides running the deck, is like you have to be the vessel for Charlie's frustration if he's losing money. So this could mean like you're getting yelled at, you're getting shouted at, spit on. And if he's really having a bad day, it means you're getting fired. Now, the first time that happens, you're like a little freaked out. <laughs> but then you find out that getting fired really means you got to go to the cafeteria, have a Coke and, or a coffee or whatever it is until they send for you to come back. And then Charlie yells at you like, where have you been? Why are you away from your post? Right. Well, you so, but it must have been quite a shock the first time it happened to you. Yeah, the first time you, you're fucking fired, you know, it's like, oh, that sucks. You know? <laughs> but then, you know, like, then you figure it out. And, um, you know, and while some of this is sort of maniacal behavior uh, by this fellow, this sort of aggressive trader, on the other hand, you know, like nothing is like it appears to be. So, you know, what Charlie's really doing is testing your metal, you know. He wants to see who you are. Maybe you're a guy who eventually he's going to put on an arm line with a, a big client. He wants to see maybe like three years from now, you're the kind of guy that he sponsors to put in the ring because, you know, Charlie has a bunch of seats and like these other brokers like Bobby and, and Greg, they don't own their seats. They're trading for Charlie and maybe Charlie's going to guarantee you to be in the ring. And that's going on. And you have to understand that everybody down there, all the clerks, and when I say clerks, you know, it's not pejorative. It's, you know, they're, they're just they're the clerks and brokers, so there are two people in the world. But they're, they're 
some of these clerks are making a lot of money too. So it's not, it's not to denigrate them. So every clerk wants to end up in the ring. That's the goal. That's why you're down there. So Charlie is sort of like sussing you out uh, to some extent. And also he just is pissed off and he wants to blow off steam. So thankfully, I don't do that job for very long because um, I, a tall kid from Villanova turns up in the operation. And, uh, you know, Charlie's not that tall. And he really likes yelling at tall people. So, <laughs> so I'm not like tall enough to be worth yelling at all. What is he have like some sort of short man complex where he likes yelling at guys that are taller than him? <laughs> uh, your, your words, not mine. What can I say? Uh, yes. So, so then I get I go work in. Uh, I get to move into the booth, and the booth is you know, um, where orders come in, you know, like wirehouse orders, uh, you know, we have Shearson comes in, uh, uh, we had a direct line to Stotler, which is a big agricultural company. And, um, you know, they like order desks, nothing too dramatic. They would put in orders, you know, we'd send them out there. And then there were a couple of phone banks and, you know, people from the outside had different, um, different lines, you know, and, and one guy would call in this cotton broker named Paul Jones. He'd call up and he, you know, want to do his, you know, 30 lots of gold, you know, guys who were on the exchange when they were in their offices, they, they, uh, you know, call in. And occasionally we had, you know, guys from London who were dealing with, I suppose, big Middle Eastern punters who just, you know, this was, you know, the horse racing was over. So, you know, <laughs> let's create some gold. Um, I, and, but while you're in the booth, Oh, and also, some of you remember, you had to develop what was called an ear for the market. So it's not just noise. You had to sort of know what was going on. So, And when you picked up the phone, more often than not, no one said who they were. They said, where's the market? So you pick up the phone, where's the market? It's 30 bid and a half. The guy goes, I'm a half bid for 50, meaning he's bidding into the offer. Right. And if he's bidding into the offer, he's expecting to get something. And if you're off the market, Let's say the market is happy at 70 and you say it's 30 bit and a half. He says, I'm happy. You're, you know, he's going to be very unhappy. Right. Or more importantly, if Charlie's off the floor and he picks up the phone, he calls on one of the outside lines and asks you where the market is and you don't know where it is. It's like a Ralph Steadman painting coming out of the phone to bite your head off. And it's just, you know, horrific. So you have to sort of learn to have this ear for the market and, the important about that is as you move on, the next stage of this sort of development is you become an ARB clerk. So an ARB clerk is someone who is generally quoting the market to a bullion dealer or a spec. Actually, we had one of our big clients was a big Canadian bank uh, who uh, was on with us. I won't mention the name, but if I said smoke salmon, I bet you'd figure out who that was. Um, so the ARB clerks are... Um, so eventually I become an art clerk, which is sort of like a cool job. And you're on the phone with someone all day. And the only reason I'm sort of going on and on about this experience is that, you know, M Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours. It's like, imagine quoting the market to somebody six hours a day, five days a week for a couple of months at a time for some of these guys, a couple of years, you know, so it's 30 bit and a half, 30 bit and a half, half bid, half trades. Half at 70, half at 70, JP Morgan at 70, 70, Mikata at 70, 70's trade, half given, 30 bit at half. Like, do that for six hours a day. You're going to, you know, people talk about, you know, watching price action. You know, this is all you did for, for hours upon hours and days upon days. So I, I, I only offer it up as sort of like this was, you know, a full immersion into what a trading market is like. So that's, that's, that's fascinating. So you're, you're there doing that. And was the, our job, your last job there before you decided no. you're going to make a change or did you? No, very good question. So, um, so I'm sort of a responsible person. I'm showing up for work every day in my off hours and I'm not trying to develop a coke habit like a lot of my colleagues. So I, I end up, Running, Charlie takes me off the arb line, makes me run the booth. Eventually, I run the. I'm running the business. So three and a half years in, I'm Eddie. You oh, know, okay. which is 
So, which is sort of unusual. And then I sort of have to make a, a decision of what I want to do. You know, I'm sort of in line to maybe go into the ring and get sponsored by Charlie. I'm not next in line by any stretch of the imagination, but my you career development. It happening. Yeah, yeah, and I'm on the what they would call the trajectory to do that. Right. And I'm not sure if um, I want to do that or not. And um, I decide to, you know, apply to Wall Street at that point in time. is sort of like whether you, uh, you know, for guys who we used to call upstairs traders, you know, there were like different times whether you needed to get an MBA or not get an MBA. And sometimes they didn't care and sometimes they did. So this is like 1985. And it was sort of the times that they cared about that. So I applied to business school. I'm working on the exchange. But uh, I, before I go on to that, I'd like to share a story with you. And when we talked last time, I didn't say, I don't want to tell any war stories, but this is sort of relevant because I think in preparing for this um, podcast, you think about things that were relevant and impacted you over the course of your career. So it's sort of the winter of 1985, I don't know, February, March, something like that. And uh, in markets are very uninteresting. You know, we're there doing our job every day. Market maybe has a $12 range, maybe a $9 range, you know. Markets farting around, gold markets farting around around $300 an ounce. And one day, there's some sort of news. And again, you don't really have access to news. It's, again, it's a very antiquated time. Something's going on in, the, um, in some Ohio banks. And gold starts ticking up. So gold starts ticking up, and we end up limit up. Nothing we haven't seen before. So limit up is twenty five dollars. Why don't you explain to people because we have some people haven't seen limits uh, because it seems okay. like we never Lim- happen anymore. It's sort of like a circuit breaker yeah. in the commodities market. Uh, so things don't go on forever. It's sort of like a circuit breaker. So in gold, then limit up was thirty five. Uh, was twenty five dollars. So no trades can go on above that price. Right. Right in futures. Right. And, and cash keeps trading. Correct. And the thing that's interesting about this, for the first time, and I've seen some limit up days. Um, usually what happens is Mark goes limit up, uh, everything sort of stops trading, uh, cash market stops trading. This day, futures are up, limit up, $25. Spot, cash, is up $39. And that's something I've never seen before. And, um, okay, so we all go home, whatever, and we find out that there's a nascent options uh, business, uh, not business, but uh, options uh, ring that has been developed. So there's like a small little options, uh, you know, trading adjacent to the uh, the gold, the Comex gold is Comex gold options. Not very big, maybe on any given day, maybe 12 or 15 traders. So we find out that, or it's determined that there's been a husband and wife team and another player who's been, guess what? Shorting options, mm-hmm. great. So they they're shorting options. They have shorting options, and um, all of a sudden, their clearing company gets a fourteen million dollar margin call. That clearing company is Charlie's clearing company. Charlie and his partner, the other biggest local on the floor, and, and fourteen uh, million bucks back then was a lot of money. It is a lot yeah. of money for sure, yeah. but. The exchange could probably make that go away, or at least sort it out. And um, the exchange says no. And they let Charlie's Clearing Company go under. And uh, that is a very sobering thing to see. One is, you know, what's the takeaway from this? One is, you know, nobody's bigger than the market, no matter what you know, you're, you're whatever. And I, I would say, listen, Charlie ended up coming back from this and, you know, but it was humiliating and it was expensive. And the other thing that I saw, two other things that I saw around this was that um, all the guys like his buddies who cleared with him were totally at risk. So I remember seeing the ashen faces of a lot of other brokers on the floor who cleared at their, at this uh, company you know, who saw everything they had sort of maybe disappear, maybe not disappear. And uh, it just was in- incredible. And then watching the, you know, the raping, the pillaging when they, you know, cleaned up the market, you know, like it was ridiculous. Um, 
But I, I'll tell you something that's aside that, I mean, I, I would say seeing that actually I, allowed me to make a lot of money about 25 years later, or 20 years later, because, uh, and I, I don't want to jump around here, but I knew Bear Stearns was going to go under. And I knew Bear Stearns, this is in 2008 or whatever that was. And I knew no one was going to be there for them. Because I don't know if you remember, and I'm moving way forward, is like when uh, long-term capital went under. You remember that? Yeah, for sure. So there was like a Sunday night meeting with all the investment banks and the Fed. And the, and the Fed had arranged it. They weren't in the room, Correct. but they had arranged it, yes. Yes. So they were all in the room. Oh, yeah. And everyone decides doing. what they're going to pony up. Yeah. And Bear Stern says, fuck you. The only Not. one. Correct. And I remember that. 20 some odd years later. And I know, I mean, I know Bear Stearns is in trouble. I know Lehman's in trouble, not terribly clever, but I know that nobody's going to help those guys out. Right. And I was short a lot of Bear Stearns puts in my PA. So you long the puts? I long the puts, yeah, right? Sorry, yeah. Long the puts, short, short Bear Stearns yeah. the puts because I saw Char- Charlie go down 20 years earlier. So, so that's fascinating. So, um, Charlie is the clearing firm, and so he actually owns the clearing firm. And he was, yes. so he was not only doing he was all a broker business, and a clearer. Oh, okay. You might say conflict of interest, and you would be right, but yeah. And, so he was a clearer, and I worked for his operations for his brokerage operations, but he had a clearing company separate to that, right? And so, although the exchange makes good on everybody's trades, they don't make good on the clearing house, they choose not to. Right. And, and so, so other times that they, they choose to, to help the clearing house out. I, it was the only time I saw it. And it was the only time I saw it up close and personal. They could have, the exchange had $14 million to make it all sort of sorted out easily. Yeah. But they chose not to. Right. And I think some of that was personal, personal. Oh, yeah. personal. And plus they might want to send a message because if you start le- the whole kind of slippery slope uh, argument. Yes. And also message to future shorting options.com. <laughs> Optionsellers.com. Whatever Optionsellers.com. Yeah. Whatever that guy is, uh, you know, you're not the first guy to blow up being short options. And two is take off your Rolex before you get on the, uh, <laughs> that's right. And number off. three is don't trade with your wife. Um, <laughs> yes. Right. So, so okay. So, so it blows up. Story. And so you all of a sudden so, have to get a job. Pardon me. And so he blows up, and you have to. You're looking for a job. No, 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 no. The 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 the, the clearinghouse blows up. The the floor brokerage survives. Oh, they keep going. They keep running yeah. their floor yeah. operations. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, you know, at this point, I'm trying to figure out what's next for me. So, so like I said, I applied to business school, and uh, you know, much to many people's shock, I get accepted to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania uh, for an MBA program. Okay. And, and I go there and um, we can skip a lot about this because it's not terribly interesting, but three things happen that are really good there. One is I make a really good friend first semester and we have all our classes together and then we fall in love second semester and then we end up getting married and we become just obnoxiously happy for the rest of our lives. Oh, that's, that's awesome. great. <laughs> so that's like a really good thing. So thank you, University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> worth every, every nickel of tuition. Uh, so also, MBA school is, uh, we don't have to talk about it. It's not that interesting, but it's really a two-year job search. You know, the Wall Street ter- firms come down and they sort of recruit and whatever. So the first semester, you're sort of doing accounting. Second semester, you're looking for a summer job. Third semester, you're looking for a permanent job. Fourth semester, you're like waiting for your permanent job. Right. But I get a summer internship because that's what you do. It's very important. You get a summer internship between your first and second year. And I get a summer internship at a, um, I'd say either it's what's called a commercial bank or a money center bank. And I get, um, I get attached to the foreign exchange area. Okay. And these guys are, you know, you know, they're the serious folks in that market at that juncture in time, you know, because they have branches all over the world and they do commercial lending to companies all over, whatever. So, you know, being a summer intern uh, is a great job be- uh, as an MBA because you basically you just go around, you try to make people like you, and hopefully they offer you a full-time job. You try to figure and out the little... new sneaking combos into the off into the floor. Exactly. Right. A little less dramatic, but sort of. 
And um, so I get, and you do like some sort of summer project. So I get assigned to the foreign exchange area and there, the global head of foreign exchange has just moved to New York from London. And he's an English dude. And again, without having to sneak any food into him, he sort of takes a liking to me. And I do like this nice little project for him. It's not terribly clever, but he likes it. And in the afternoons, I get like to sit with him. So I sit, you know, sort of in the center of this foreign exchange dealing room. And we get to talk to each other. And he's sort of nice, you know, and, uh, you know, smoking Rothmans, you know, Rothmans blue all day. You know. People don't understand that they used to smoke on desks. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. I mean, this guy, he was, you know, from one, you know, put out, you know, lit the next one with the last one. <laughs> That's right. It was and, a big uh, ashtray in uh, the middle of the desk. Yeah, 100%. You know, he's got the Saville Rue suit, messy hair, you know, it looks like John Cleese, but, you know, richer. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, he, you know, and what I discover a little bit about this, so he's got, so we have the dealing room, you know, customers, all that kind of stuff. But he's got a, 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 a pal in the back, you know, in an office, like locked up in a little office in the back. And I find out that that's sort of his sort of pal, you know. And that guy's sitting in the office away from the trading desk uh, doing charts, you know, point. But this is before this is everything's done by hand. He's doing point and figure charts uh, by hand back there. And every now and then he comes out and puts in an order, not a big order, you know, not, not small, but I don't know, $25 million, something like that, you know, not nothing, but, you know, not crazy. Right. And what I learned is that this guy who's global head of foreign exchange, usually this falls under the, the treasury area. And he, sometimes they're, they're also head of treasury, head of foreign exchange. And these guys are sort of punting around and, you know, the, uh, in the treasury area and um, his pal in the back is sort of just taking positions based on the charts and putting in orders for him. So this is and for the I, firm's book is what yes, you're saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or for, for, for the head traders book. Right. So it's a prop, it's a prop account. Sort of, but not, that doesn't really exist yet. Right. But that's I mean, what it's exactly the, what the, it is. the original prop account. Which is called a hedging account, by the oh, way. Oh, okay. It's not a prop account. It's a hedging account. That's why it's living in the treasury area and not in the foreign exchange area. Okay. But you're a hundred. But your your bunny has a good nose, and you are correct. And um, so, I, I go out there with him. We and he invites me to talk to this guy in the back one day, and we're talking. It's a Friday afternoon, and. He, you know, I say to him, I said, you know, I know you're doing these charts, and you're making decisions, but it's Friday afternoon, there's nothing going on. How can you make any kind of tr determination to put a trade on or not on a quiet Friday afternoon? And the head trader, the, the global head of foreign exchange, is something to me that is really rings to me still to the day. So I'm not going to try to do a British accent, but he looks at me and goes, the market's always the market. Okay, so what does that mean? In that moment, I sort of understand what he's saying that, you know, if you're looking at the charts, you know, that, that price on a Friday afternoon is the byproduct of every price that came before it and is sort of a data point for every moment in time for the future. And that is a, a, at least a way to make a decision. Over the years, though, I, I go back to that all the time. The market's always the market. And for me, that resonates like the market doesn't care about you doesn't care about your hopes dreams and ambitions doesn't care about how much you fucking back tested your trade doesn't care that you sort of get stopped out on the lows your options expire on thursday the market moves on friday the market's always the market and i i really internalize that and that becomes something that i really go back to a lot because the market's not t telling a story the market is just the market in it's always the market and it's just the market. And I didn't really understand it at that moment in time, but it's something that I put in my pocket and I traveled with for the rest of my career. And it was really important. Uh, and that's why I bring it up. Oh, that's, fa so, that's fascinating. And it was the, it was the English dude in the back that was hidden away. Right. And plus, you know, John Cleese in the Savile street with the Rothmans. <laughs> right. 
And uh, by the way, I, I want to, because I'll revisit him later on. The dude in the back, he's got like a bro, he's got a mustache, he's got a broken nose. I'm hoping it's like rugby and not street fighting, but that's who that guy is. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I go back to business school, whatever, and um, I get recruited by, let's call it a very prominent investment bank. And they um, hire me. Again, people at the University of Pennsylvania are shocked by this because, you know, I didn't go to Princeton. I didn't go do a two-year, you know, analyst program at Merrill Lynch. You know, I spent, you know, my early years getting yelled at by a guy named Charlie. So, like, why am I getting recruited by this investment bank? So, I get recruited by this investment bank in the foreign exchange area. Okay. So... Uh, in the, in the foreign exchange area, which is housed in the commodity division, okay. and uh, mostly because you know they're looking at foreign exchange sort of in the same way they look at commodities. You know, we're going to do some arbitrage, we're going to uh, quote some customers, and it's a very nascent business at that juncture in time. Now, um, we talked a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about like. Funny enough, I, I'm there at this investment bank in the foreign exchange area, and I don't realize it, but I'm both going to become a witness and a participant to what is becomes really proprietary trading at this investment bank. And it's a sort of ground zero for it. And what becomes over the next 15 to 18 years, a very big part of their business. And... It starts in the foreign exchange area. And what year is this? And this is 1980. I, I turn up there in 1987. Okay. So, and you, you when we talked briefly a few weeks ago, you, know, you said, you know, both it becomes what's called proprietary trading and what it also becomes doesn't have a name yet. It's global macro trading, which doesn't have a name, but that's what it becomes. And you, when I told you what year it was, and you said to me, like, well, you ended up there at, you know, the golden age of macro trading. And Mr. Muir, you were correct. It was the golden age of macro trading. <laughs> and I know it because I was there. And I also know it that there's a couple of fellows who I'm still friends with, a couple who've on, gone on to spectacular careers. And we still get together some one or two are very dear friends of mine. And we get together for a steak and some, you know, red wine every now and then. And, uh, you know, we catch up, kids, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then sort of by the end of the third bottle, you know, everyone looks at each other and we go like, that was fucking crazy, like what was going on. <laughs> and uh, so just to sort of for your listening audience out there, um, it's important for me to describe, one, the landscape of the markets, of the foreign exchange markets, circa 1987, 1992, uh, and some of the players. So we're coming up sort of on the, the heels of what was, you know, of Richard Dennis and guys understanding trading markets from the, the late 80s. I don't know if you know who Richard Dennis is. Yeah, so I'm sure I, you know who Richard yeah. Dennis is. Why don't you tell people, though, of, because not everyone's going to know who Richard Dennis is. Right, so Richard Dennis was a very big trader uh, in, in the Chicago commodities markets. And he um, sort of, I won't say he discovered, but he certainly uh, promoted this notion that, you know, trading every day and too much trading – doesn't really do anything if you traded less and markets trend and you could figure out a way to sort of hold on your positions for longer periods of time, you you know, and get it with a trend, you'd be able to make more money. And, you know, he had, you know, he basically had a bet, you know, whatever he, with his friend and, you know, there were very simple ways to, again, to sort of um, sort this out, whether it was on moving averages and, it wasn't that complicated. Right. And there were a lot of opportunities. And he was the famous one who talked about the, he was going to train uh, traders. The turtles. The yeah. Turtles. It's him. And, you know, he, he ends up, you know, the, I'm not sure it ends great for him, but he has, he has huge success for a while. Uh, so, so the, we're on the sort of entering the sort of on the heels of the, of Richard Dennis's understanding of the markets and guess what? You put all the markets in the super collider in 1987. What you discover is what are the best trending markets? Currencies. Yes. They trend. 
So what does that mean to your listing audience? Let's just put it this way. Let's say dog ends at 102. So it goes from 102 to 105 to 106. It doesn't mean that it's going to go to 118 or 120, but it very well might. And, you know, that is an opportunity. And not only is it an opportunity, is that if you're looking at 102 and 103 or 104 and you're not sure what to do, um, you know, like I used to say back in the day, if you miss the express at 102, you pick up the local at 106 and you're going to get to 118, you know, and it just made it, it made it, I won't say easy because markets aren't easy, but it was very opportunistic. And again, so this is sort of the context of the foreign exchange markets. And then you got to look at some of the players. So some of the players are the central banks, right? And again, this is back in the 80s. There's, there's no euro. So there's, you know, there's a French franc, there's the Italian lira, there's, you know. The Deutschmark, the, the big one. Data. Pardon the me? The Deutschmark, the big one. Well, the Deutschmark is forever, yeah. right? So, you know, and so you have all these central banks and they, you know, it's not like here where, you know, you look at the last couple of years where everyone's on a race to zero in the same direction. These guys have conflicting agendas. You know, they, they're not aligned at all. And um, some guys are raising rates, some guys are lowering rates. You don't really, you know, it's not like you don't know, but you have to sort of figure that out. And the other thing about interest rates as they relate to currencies, and this, in my humble opinion, and this is something that one of the cornerstones of, through which I look at the markets is that interest rate differentials matter because an interest rate expectations matter. So there's like this ocean of money in the world that is sloshing around looking for yield always. Forget about today when everything's zero. But back then, US 10-year rates, I don't know, they're like 11%, you know, Italy rates are higher, you know, and there's this sort of ocean of money moving around chasing yield and if you understand where rates are going, you sort of have a leg up on understanding of where currencies may be trading. So that's really critical. And then what's interesting regarding the central banks are, you know, people say trading is a zero sum game. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. If it was true, there would be as many rich people, or good traders and bad traders. But, but the currency markets are different because the central banks are not rational operators. They, you know, you and I, we, we participate in the markets to get make money. Central banks, they're essentially the double zero on the roulette wheel. You may be me, I may be black, you may be red, and then there's this double zero. We don't, they're not, other than I remember the Swiss National Bank, nobody ever um, put out their um, trading results. So these guys have a different agenda. And, you know, and plus they're intervening, you know, they like think that they can support, you know, or we, you know, like they're not, you and I would buy a, a dollar or buy a currency because we thought it was going to go up there. They may be doing that to defend or, you know, or weaken a currency, you know, and I see the Bank of England raising its hand in the back of the room. We'll get to you in a minute. Um and, you know, at this time, I'll tell you something, I'll share something that was really interesting that I, I met a guy at this point in my career. He's like a senior banker in Latin America, American dude, much older than me, like in his 50s. I'm in my 30s. And he finds out what I'm doing and he looks at me and goes like, you know, the thing that you have to remember, and he's in Brazil, Mexico, that world, because it's very easy to um, strengthen a strong currency or weaken a strong currency. It's very easy to weaken a right. strong currency, but it's almost impossible to strengthen a weak currency. Right. Like in England, I hear you talking, but you got to sit down for a while. <laughs> so, so, um, so, and again, so what does global macro mean? And again, so, so we have, we have these players and we have these interest rates and we have these flows and we have these trends and allows tremendous opportunities to make money. And um, the additional, in addition to that, what you have is, um, where does the term global macro come from? So it comes from the notion that um, big macro trends are going to be played out in the currency markets. At least they were back then. And I will give an example. And 
for those of you at home, you know, if it sounds like I'm channeling the Duke brothers talking to Eddie Murphy and trading places, that's exactly what I'm doing. So let's just imagine, I don't know, 1990, and um, this wall comes down in Berlin, okay? So this wall comes down in Berlin, and this country, West Germany, is going to take over this country, East Germany. And that's going to be expensive, right? So um, you got to figure the Deutsche Marks, like that's going to like it's going to be social programs, whatever. It's got, it's, you know, they're they're determined. It's a political thing, not an economic thing. So Deutsche Mark's probably going to this proud Deutsche Mark with this proud central bank. They're going to sort of um, um, probably it's probably going to be bad for the Deutsche Mark. Same time. You know, this is 1990 or 19, whatever, 89. There's this country in the Far East called Japan, and they're fucking killing it. And uh, they have a currency called the yen. So what are we going to do? Why don't we sell Deutschmarks? Buy the yen. Okay, we're going to do that. And we're going to do that a lot. And, you know, the market starts trending that way. And then over time, the discussion becomes like, oh, well, we have this Deutschmark over here and we have this shit currency that was the East German mark over there, which had been trading prior to the wall coming down 20 to one. So, okay, so we're going to be a a bunch of traders and, you know, we're going to try to figure out where they're going to sort of reval this thing. And um, people are talking about, you know, and we're already short the mark against the end. And, um, you know, no one believes what ultimately happens. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to trade it one for one, no. and then the Deutsche Mark just fucking tubes, and you know the yen stays the same. And that trade is a trade that, you know, we'll go into later. We're in for a year, and um, you know, we make a lot of money. So back to back to Leslie Harris. So that that's just sort of the. The macro policy, how it plays out in the in the foreign exchange market. So I'm like, you know, I'm there. I get there. I'm like a, a market maker or a dealer, or whatever. And um, so I would say that at this particular firm, the the genesis of proprietary trading really happens out of the guys in London. There's some very aggressive traders there. They're um, super smart. They're figuring stuff out. Stuff against you know carry trades against the Scandies. Um, you know, very aggressive, and they they have a very trading culture there. In New York, where I'm working, it's really coming up through the sales side, um, trying to build franchise business, um, you know, hiring salesmen, making markets to customers, whatever. But the guys in London start making some money. And, um, you know, to the guy, not to the traders, because, like I said, I'm very close to still to some of those guys. You know, so they decide to put two of the most senior traders to make them, again, proprietary traders, where they're going to just not in support of any particular book or, or business. They're just going to take outright risk. So they're doing that. So how do I end up being a proprietary trader in New York? Um, some of that is, you know, I guess the expression is failing forward, you know, Uh I'm not very interested in making markets. Uh, I, um, I'm not that interested. I'm not that good at it. I'm certainly not interested in doing uh, arbitrage against the futures. And I've already, in the course of my first two years there, um, had some success sort of doing some out-of-the-box kind of stuff, some options trading, you know, some directional stuff. And um, I have an appetite for risk. And I say that because the risk was there to be had, and not everybody took it. Um, some guys like looked away, like oh, I just want to be flat at the end of the day, and you know, trade the, the customer flow. Some other guys were, you know, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, you know, whatever. Me, it's like, oh, this is I, I like this. I'm going to do some of this, and then sort of organically, I end up sitting with the two proprietary traders in New York. Um, both very different guys, different backgrounds, different met- methodologies. One guy's a very fixed income driven, short rate kind of guy trying to restrict rates. Uh, the other guy, very technical uh, driven. And I sort of embrace a lot of what 
he has to offer to me in terms of technical analysis. And, you know, this is like 1990. And, um, you know, we're sitting there, you know, just chatting away, putting on trades, making money. And, um, you know, and we're doing different things. Like we're trying different things and like no one's sort of stepping in the way. And we're making some some good dough. And, you know, people are starting to notice. So the guys from Risk Arb start coming down to sort of hang out with us during the day. You know, the economists, uh, you know, who end up being Fed governors come sit down. And, Why, what do you think about the market? What do you think about the short end? Whatever. And, you know, it, it's pretty glorious time, you know. Uh, again, so at this juncture, I'm about like five years into my really risk-taking career. And to be perfectly frank, my, you know, my trading abilities have not caught up to my confidence or arrogance. But, um, but, I feel like that's, that's a sign that I'm still waiting for mine to, to catch up. Right. I, me too. But, but I didn't know it at the time. Like now I know, you know, back then I didn't know. So, um, you know, so again, and I, you know, I'm making some money and we're making some money. I'm starting to think about the markets in a different way. Uh, you know, I'm very much a student in the markets and I, I, and I like it. And I'm starting to think about, um, you know, returns on capital, things like that. Like, you know, for example, let's say a guy's taking a $100 million position, generates $12 million worth of P&L. Somebody else is taking a $50 million position, it's generating $8 million of P&L. Which is the better one? You know, you tell me. I think it's the, you know, $8 million on the $50 million. But the firm is like looks at things in absolute terms. And, you know, I'm a little, you know, just thinking about things a little bit differently. And then, you know, the... Let's just put it this way. The compensation structure is sort of awkward, to say the least. And, you know, uh, it's not very empirical at all. And somewhere out there in the world now, the hedge funds are starting to poach good traders and people are looking at things on return on capital and people are getting payouts and stuff like that. And, uh, again, I'm, I'm a little over my skis in terms of my, you know, notion of how great of a trader I am. But... You know, I'm thinking about things like that. And, you know, I'm trying to think about what my future is at the firm. And then there's the last thing, which, you know, our good friend Morris will, uh, can attest to at some point. It's like, I realize I'm really bad at office politics, like really bad. And I realized that office politics is going to be important for me to be successful at this firm. And to illustrate how bad I am at this, at one juncture, I call a meeting with the guy who runs the department and, uh, you know, I'm bad at it because one is I think Wall Street should be a meritocracy, uh, foolish, naive, idiot. Uh, the other thing is I tell people the truth. I don't really, I realize that's a real liability. Uh, but at one point I have a meeting with the guy who runs the department and I let him know that I'm really not comfortable with the way he's managing me, nor do I think I'm comfortable with the way he's managing the department. <laughs> So, and that person goes on to like, he's managing the party, he's managing foreign exchange sales and trading. And then he ends up managing the whole commodities division. And then he ends up managing the whole firm, uh, the, the, you know, the fixed income division. Oh, okay. And then at some point, he does end up managing yeah. the whole fucking firm. <laughs> so, just to let you know how bad I was at that. So, and he does. And, you know, as I like to say years later, I, it's like, you know, I stand by what I said in the meeting, but, you know, it certainly worked out better for him, you know, than me. So, okay. So, so that juncture, there's another format. And like, I'm there about five years at this point, five or six years. And um, there's another institution out there in the world. Let's call them a merchant bank for better or worse. And um, they have a very keen trading culture and uh, very big foreign exchange presence. And, you know, and they love poaching people from this particular firm. Uh, I don't realize that at the time, but like, yeah. It's a badge of honor. A hundred percent. And so I go work for them and this is like 1993. And I always know 1993 as a red letter date in, in history because in the world of uh, proprietary trading and the global financial markets. It's a year pigs could fly. 
Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, that's if you look it up in the book under P, you know, in the index, Pigs Could Fly, 1993. Uh, because it is the, the biggest bull market in European bonds that we've ever seen to date. And at this firm, you know, anyone who wants to become a proprietary trader raises their hand, gets gets the job, and gets long Italian bonds. And uh, I don't know if I'm remembering this absolutely correctly, but there was a guy there who, uh, and I'm there to trade foreign currency, so I'm not really involved in any of this stuff. But there's a guy there who single-handedly takes down the 10-year auction, Danish auction by himself. Like, oh, you were allowed to he, buy the whole thing? He did. <laughs> and and guess what? doesn't work out that great. And again, if I'm wrong about this, it was a long time ago, but this is how I remember okay. it. Doesn't work out great. So what does he do? The next next auction does the same thing again. That's like what's going on. So this is 1993, and two interesting things happened to me. I, again, I'm getting much more interested in technical analysis, and I'm sort of falling under the specter of Bob Prechter and the Elliott Wave as well. So I got all that going on, and sort of towards the end of 1993, I'm not I'm not making much, losing much. I'm just sort of getting it done. Because uh, I'm not involved in the, in, the, in the European bond markets, and so all that's where the action is. So at the end of 1993, I do uh, one thing: I, I get off the trading floor and I move up into an office um, with a couple of bond traders. One's a mortgage trader, two are U.S. fixed income traders. One guy's sort of trading the balance sheet, which I don't understand at all. Um, and we're up there. It's 1994, and um, I. I remember there's um, it's early in the year, like maybe February or March. I don't remember exactly. There's a non-farm par- uh, non-farm payroll number that comes out, and um, you know I have my potpourri of uh, you know positively correlated trades. I'm short the S and P's. I'm short the FTSE. I'm short cable, whatever. And um, number comes out, and for the record out there, for those of you keeping score, Leslie Harris's record and non-farm pro- payroll numbers are like. You know, non farm payroll 190, Leslie 8. So I, I get this stuff wrong routinely. It doesn't stop me from doing it. I do well, you know what? That's actually worth You know, it's hard to be that wrong. It's hard. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. hard. Absolutely. But the good thing is, like, I've also traded through a lot of uh, Bundesbank announcements around, um, around currency, around interest rates. So I know that these things are sort of squirrely. You know, I actually, I, I I have a, a printout of a Knight Ritter screen where uh, I forgot it was 815 or 845. I forgot when the Bundesbank used to make their announcements. Like, Bundesbank rates unchanged, you know, 830 or 815, whatever it is. Four minutes later, it's like, correction, Bundesbank like lowers, you know, current, you know, interest rates by a quarter percent. So, so the only reason I mention this is like because of the Bundesbank, I've sort of instituted like the 20 minute rule. Ah. Like, I don't trade out of my positions on a big number, no matter what, for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Partly because it's, you know, there's the knee-jerk reaction, whatever. And if you're fucked, you're fucked. It doesn't matter. And you never know what's going to happen. So so this number comes out in February or March uh, of 1994. And um, I remember it very distinctly. So I'm the wrong way around. I guess the number comes in weaker. I got all these bullish, you know, bearish trades on, bullish all trades on. And, you know, okay, the market's doing its thing. And around 9 o'clock, Alan Greenspan makes a comment. And it's a very aggressive comment about interest rate policy. Okay. And, you know, everything flips around. Bonds start tanking, you know, sterling tanks, you know, uh, you know, S&Ps tank, whatever. And I only, you know, good day for me, but it's a sea change in what was going on in the in the bond markets, and that's what's important. And so the bond markets get shellacked for a whole and year, almost right. Like it's really ugly. Afterwards, oh so, yes, but because it's been a bull market, what do you do in a bull market? Well, you buy the dip. So you buy the dip, and um, not me, but the you know the the rest of the bank that's long bonds up the wazoo. No, it's like, okay, well, we've seen this before. We're going to buy the dip. They buy the dip. Fucking carnage in, uh, in the bond market. And the bank loses, you know, 
again, a modest amount at this juncture, like $200 million. And um, $200 million, so all of a sudden that the guys who are supposed to be in charge of all this to sort of get, you know, well, you know, my, you know. so they shut down all the proprietary trading, which is a big business. Oh. For them. And everything goes like, everyone go home for a couple of weeks and let's see what happens. So we all get flat, whatever, you know, and this is not, you know, great. So uh, I'm like trying to figure out what's going on. I like to be a team player. I'm not doing anything. So at coincident, not coincidentally, I have a, a childhood friend who's working at this firm up in Greenwich, Connecticut. And it turns out that they have a, for whatever the need, I don't even know why they have foreign exchange trading going on there, but they have a need for someone to trade foreign exchange. So the childhood friend says, you know, why don't you, you know, this seems like a bad situation. What, what's going on? Why don't you come in there and interview? And um, I do. And the firm's Greenwich Capital, you know, where our, where he is a young chestnut at that point in time, not an old chestnut. <laughs> and he's, you know, working there. And uh, uh, so I go up there and I interview and they offer me a job, which I turn down because I'm trying to figure out how many bad career decisions I can make before I'm 35 years old. <laughs> and um, so, and I don't know how this happens, but it's interesting because it's sort of where Morris enters my life. And so I don't know if I turn it down and they say, go out with the boys, whatever. I, I go out for, they, I don't know in the, in where, whether I've turned down the job or they want me to come, whatever. Uh, so I, they say, go out to dinner with a couple of the boys. And I say boys because it was mostly boys back then, you know, so that's just the way the world was. So I go up to Greenwich Avenue, uh, which is called the Avenue up there. I'm living in lower Manhattan. I drive up there. And uh, we go to this Italian restaurant, you know, you know, what passes for good food in Greenwich, Connecticut at that point in time. <laughs> you know, fried calamari and, uh, you know, pizza. <laughs> And uh, so we go in One there. Second, Leslie, you know, that's probably going to be the most controversial thing you say on this podcast. I doubt that because that's fu that's in stone. Oh, is it everyone that's agrees on that? Uh, if you don't, then you've never had decent food. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, so, and you know, I, I have the pleasure of meeting Mara Sachs for the first time. There's another fellow there. I think his name is if if, I, if my memory is correct, it's a guy named Will. And we get out there. You know, just a bunch of guys, you know, talking, you know, about the markets, whatever. And Morris probably doesn't remember this. So I, dinner's over. You know, we're all very amiable. It's a good, great evening. And I walk outside of the restaurant, and there's this cherry red Mercedes SEL two-seater. It's the wintertime, so the hardtop's on. Beautiful. And, you know, Morris walks out, and I'm like, you know, a snarky, stupid kid. And I say, oh, well, Morris, I see you got like a good parking spot. You know, it's like cherry red Mercedes <laughs> SEL. And he goes, yeah. And then he like hops into the car. And I go like, oh, if that dude is driving that car, I got to work with this firm. So so I ended up work, working at Grinch. I go to work at Grinch Capital. And um, it's very interesting. So it, the, the, the way things work at Grinch at that point is like the – as opposed to what happened at the merchant bank, they create a system where like no one's going to bring down the firm in terms of the proprietary trading. So they have very, um, very, um, I won't say conservative, but very, you know, they have risk limits on the traders that, you know, they're certainly tighter than ones that I'm used to up to, up to this juncture, but the payout's better, and it's a very unambiguous payout. So I'm not going to have a conversation with somebody that I made a bad joke in you know, November three years ago, so it's going to uh, you know, impact my compensation uh, then. And um, uh, I, go, I go there to work, and there's another guy working there doing far exchange. He's, he's very close to blowing up, which is a chronicle of a death foretold. And... Um, so I'm there for a couple of months and, you know, I'm not doing much, you know, north or south of break even. You know, I, I realize that my job here is just to sort of figure things out and figure out who I am as a trader and um, try to make some money and just sort of incorporate all the 
my experiences. And I, you know, I'm not an important guy. I'm like, I like to say that Morris and I are colleagues at this point, but that's an absolute lie because he's got a real job, a really big job. And I'm like a guy sitting next to the receptionist and by the coffee machine and nobody gives a shit about me. But um, a couple of things happened in the first few months there. And uh, I'm making, a, I'm, like I said, not making or losing a lot of money. And um, at some point I have a situation where you know, I'm short a bunch of Aussie dollars, you know, something, you know, Aussie, you know, Aussie is four o'clock here is the morning there. Some news comes out. I lose some money. Um, and, um, it's not, it's not career end or anything like that, but it's going to leave a divot. It's probably like the most money I've lost up at, at that point uh, at the firm, uh, at, at, at the company. So I go to my boss at the time. Let's, for the sake of this conversation, let's call him Ray. Okay. So I go over to Ray, uh, it's like 4.30, it's like early in Australia, I go, Ray, you know, just want to let you know, um, you know, this news came out in Australia, you know, I was the wrong way around, I lost a bunch of money, you know, I just want to let you know. And he looks at me, and I, I tell the story a lot, because I, I, I work right now, you know, with a lot of senior leadership people, and um it's a real leadership moment and not so much a market moment, but it's both. And so this fellow Ray looks at me and goes, Les, you know, I really enjoy, I really appreciate you coming over and talking to me about this. It really means a lot to me. And, um, but, you know, if I need to find you, I'll find you. Other than that, just go about your business. And, you know, for some reason, for me, that's an incredible uh, example of both leadership and in terms of, you know, giving a trader a, a, a notion of empowerment and responsibility. So we don't care what you do. We expect you to be successful. That's why we hired you. Go out and make some money for us. And I'm not saying that was a big shift for me, but it was something that I remember a lot and I talk about a lot in other contexts right now. So 1994 ends and I'm starting... Like I said, I'm eight years into being a, a, a real trader at this point. I've been positioning risk. I'm doing stuff. And I got to figure out how I'm going to make it work at Grange Capital. And I become, you know, people like to say, you know, you got to figure out what your approach is or what your methodology is. And I think that's true for every trader. If you're a trader out there, you got to figure out what works for you. And different things work for different people. And for me, I kind of start figuring out that, you know, without being long-winded, like I am like a long option, a long vol option trader, because that's what's going to serve me. And I've been trading options a lot up to this juncture, but now the menu is a little bit different. Like there's what we call at that juncture in time, exotic options. Exotic, they're not so fucking exotic, you know, knockouts, knock-ins, you know, double no touches, but it's a way for you to sort of express risk by just being long premium as opposed to being short options, which we've determined is a, not the best way to go. So I, you know, I start working on different strategies on just a long option strategy. And I'm trying to, and I figure out what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And what I'm good at is that I don't mind losing money. It doesn't paralyze me. Um, and I understand that I only need to be right three or four times a year to sort of be successful. So I just need to not blow up along the way. And um, that's what I start doing. And, uh, you know, I create strategies. I, I usually have like four maybe themes uh, in, uh, in my portfolio. I have three or four trades around each theme. So I have 12 trades on. And... Uh, I always, at the end of the day, and I trade some spot around, some cash around, but it doesn't, it's not a big thing that I do, but I do that and I generally have a stop within 1% of wherever I'm in. And I look at my portfolio every day. It's like, what's the, nu what's the nuclear winter look like? So if everything goes bad, how much premium am I going to lose? Uh, I'm sorry, if you hear yeah, that noise, no problem, it's my dog. We're, my dog, we're dog friendly here at the huddle. Yeah. Um, he's, it's getting dinner time <laughs> right. for him. So he's going to, uh, so, and, and that's what I do. And so the next year, and, and not because 
anything. I, I crush it. I make a ton of money. And, and the greatest thing about it is like my year on conversation about compensation is like, takes like two minutes, one minute. And, you know, this is your revenue. These are your expenses. This is your percentage. This is what you get paid. And, uh, the thing that's interesting about that is like, no, no one's paid any attention to me other than, you know, my boss and Morris and I are friends at this point. We work out in the gym together. We, you know, you know, he's sort of looking out for me. Um, and, um, you know, I remember one point, uh, we, uh, we had a conversation like Dolly Yen sort of, sort of moving around a ton and, um, you know, I do really well in volatile markets. I, I like volatility, number one. And two is I, I really like when the shit hits the fan because for some reason I get really calm when that happens. And uh, I remember Morris, uh, again, in a very benevolent way, you know, comes over to me and says like, you know, the, this little gnarly here, you know, maybe you want to, you know, you know, take some risk off. And I just say like, this is what I'm paid for. Like, this is what, this is where I'm supposed to be participating in. And that's like what I end up doing really for a lot of my careers is sort of like figuring out when markets are going to get very, very nasty and, um, you know, figure out ways to make some money in that. And that becomes, a, you know, one of the cornerstones of, you know, how I look at the markets. So I, the funny story about this is, so I have like, whatever, it's 1995, you know, I make a... Uh, a ton of money and, and, and Greenwich Capital, they have put out like an annual report, something really nice, you know, and everyone has like, you know, in the back of it has how long people have been there and like how, who the, uh, you know, longest tenured employees are and whatever. So, you know, we made this and this, and there's like a little throwaway line, like, and we had a spectacular year in foreign currency trading. All of a sudden I got a lot of new friends at the firm, you know, <laughs> people like, you know, like people had no idea, like I'm sitting there in between the coats and the, the coffee, you know, the uh, machine and the reception area. And like, so now like people are like, oh, we, let's, let's talk to Leslie. <laughs> so you all know? of a sudden the partners That's figured great. out that you were, uh, you were putting some dollars in their pockets. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, my direct, Ray, Ray was perfect. He figured it out. He was thrilled. <laughs> you know, he got no, he had no problem. With it. So, uh, and, and, and then shortly thereafter, um, you know, again, Morris and I are, are, have become friends uh, personally, but Morris sort of takes over uh, the um, international bond trading. They call it, I don't know, uh, non-dollar sovereign debt business, which is a very long-winded title. So I kind of got like people like to look at me and like say, oh, well, you do international stuff and you now do international stuff. So why don't you guys like sort of have a professional relationship? And we do. And, um, you know, I'm going to wax poetically about Morris later on in the podcast, but so we, we start working much closer together. And, uh, so I'm at Grant's Capital now uh, for, I stay there for about five years. I have a very good run and, you know, I enjoy working there. I'm really like, have figured out who I am as a trader and what, again, you can use the word methodology or approach, but, you know, for the purpose of this podcast and anybody who's out there listening, it's like trading is hard and you really have to know who you are as a trader. And that takes time to figure out. And, you know, it took me, I think, about seven or eight years to figure it out. Uh, and if you want to be, you know, in quotes, you know, a professional trader, it's like you got to figure stuff out and you got to lose some money. You got to figure out why you lost money. You got to figure out why you're making money. And, you know, that get, because you have something to lean on, then when stuff doesn't go right, you know what, you know, like I, I looked at this, it didn't go right. And, you know, at this juncture, again, you know, uh, my methodology is, you know, it's sort of fundamentally a fundamental approach, but I do a lot of technical analysis. I look at the charts all day and that's sort of, you know, where I live as a trader. So back to the story, as boring as it is, um, you know, I get approached by um, a brand name hedge fund, a uh, bold face name hedge fund to go work for them. And I do. I, so I leave, I leave Greenwich Capital and I go work for the bold face hedge fund. You leave Morris. I do. Only for a while. I only for a while. So, so I leave Morris and um, I go work for this big hedge fund, you know, 
And again, I'm not sitting with anybody doing foreign currencies. They say, oh, you're an international guy. So I sit with the international equity guys. And um, I, what happens is, I'm, without going into it, I'm not that comfortable with some of the stuff that's going on there. And some of the international equity guys want to sort of do something on their own. So we go, go out together and launch our own hedge fund. Although before I go, I want to just share like uh, uh, something that I, I, this the founder of this hedge fund, Mercurial Billionaire, one of several I, I end up working for over time. You know, he says to me about we're talking and I, I, I'm doing a good job and he likes me and stuff. And uh, he goes at one point like, you know, being right about the market is nice, but timing's everything. And you know what? He's fucking right. And, uh, you know, it's like something like it was worth two years of my life um, working there to have that conversation with him. Because I think about that all the time as a trader. So, OK, so we go out and uh, the international equity guys, myself, and we launch our own fund um, with Boldface hedge fund managers, $200 million in, in addition to other people. Without going into it, let's just say, I won't say it's an epic fail, but it's not great. And um, then, thankfully, you know, Morris repos me back to Greenwich Capital. And Morris, at this point, is now, his career is like, you know, going great. And he we're ma he's managing a big group. And, you know, I spend the next seven years, um, or, yeah, pretty much the next seven years sitting next to him and talking about the markets and trading. And, uh, you know... This is my this is my part of the since I know he's a fan favorite and we have a, a wonderful personal relationship. This is my chance to sort of in public sort of explain what a unique market participant he is. Um, Morris is a very terrific trader. He's, he's a great trader, and but there are there are other great traders in the world, but Morris is great partly because he. Um, He's got a good sense of the market. He really knows what he's doing. He's super competent. He's just great. But what distinguishes him from most people you're going to run into in the world is that he's also a great trading manager, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. And most guys who are good traders, they get promoted to being trading managers and they suck at it. So that's like a two. So he's like a, a two tool player at this point. And he's also an amazing risk manager, which is just. To get all those three things in a, in, a, in, a, in a professional, it's very, very difficult to do. And so this is my public celebration of Morris Sachs as a, as a trading professional. So there you go. Well, that's, that's fabulous. Hopefully he's listening. I, I think he's listening. I'm pretty sure. If he's not listening at the moment, he'll be listening tomorrow. But um, so, you know, and again, so as we work together, just in, in the sense of the markets, because now we're going into like, uh, you know, the, the troubles, you know, like 2007, 2008, whatever. And so how do you, how do, what does that mean to me as a trader? Um, I have a pretty good sense when things are going to go terribly. And I don't know if it's like because I grew up with very pessimistic people who, you know, if you think if you think the, sh the world's going to come to the end every day, you know, you're not surprised when it does. And, um, you know, as we go into the what becomes the global financial crisis, I. I do really well in those kind of environments. And because you sort of know that. If things are going to go badly, they're going to go badly across the way, across the board and. If you have a sense that the mortgage market's blowing up and then the fixed income and the, you know, the money markets are going to go badly, you know, what's next? So for me, always like, well, you know, EM, like that's the, always the next shoe to drop. And, you know, I, you know, I only say this to illustrate some trading ideas that, that happen. So, you know, again, we're working with Mars, we're together, whatever. And, you know, Whenever I had a sense that things were going to go terribly, which they did, you know, buy dollar Brazil options, buy Turkey options, you know, and, you know, those are the kind of trades that as a foreign exchange trader, that like, where you got an opportunity to sort of participate in real volatility as collateral damage to whatever's going on in the world. And, um, and, you know, 
we used to have an, exp- I, an expression that I coined is like, you know, have you ever been to a casino? I've only been to a casino like two or three times in my life. Yeah, have I've you? been. I, I had a little card counting st- stage when I would go and thought I was the next. Yeah, Very yeah, boring. Was, if you want to go to a casino, you well, want to no, see, that's my problem. I, I thought I had an edge and I wanted to just exploit the edge, uh, you know. By the, by the way, for those of you out there listening who, if you're ever interviewed for a job and someone says, what's your edge? Just walk out. <laughs> Like that's the stupidest question anyone can ever ask somebody in a trading interview. It's like, you know, who has the edge? The market has the edge. It's like your job is sort of figure out an approach. They should ask you what your approach is, not what your edge is. So, but I digress, as they say. So um, the um, the um, so we used to have an expression like, you know, there's one expression like, you know, um, everything reverts to one, you know, but. In, in in the markets when the shit's hitting the fan, it's like they bring out the big rake. So it's like they're going to come for the mortgages, they're going to come for the money markets, they're going to come for the currencies, and you know they kind of. And in the end, when things are really bad, they just scoop all the money off the table. It's like a craps table. If you think about the financial markets as a craps table, like what is the collateral damage that can happen? What is the contagion? What's what are the things you need to worry about? And, you know, that was something I was very good at, um, you know, and uh, it served me very, very well. So and uh, Morris and I ended up having a, a good seven or eight years together. You know, uh, I sat next to him and we, you know, made some good money and had a lot of fun. OK, so, uh, Leslie, thank you for sharing all that. Awesome. Awesome story. Is that a little long. No, no, I, I love every bit of I just let you go because you uh, it was all fascinating. And I, and I, I have made notes. I, I've, I have some of your lines all ready to go for future reference to them. And I'll say, Leslie Harris said this. So let's talk a little bit about your approach to equities. Because to me, when you're telling me the story of, of how you did so well in times of volatility, I found that actually fascinating. It's almost like you strive in chaos. And yet here we are. And you're the fellow that's been long some of the most high-flying, crazy growth stocks, and you close your eyes and just own them. And it seems yes. – I, I actually have a theory about w- what it is that, that enables you to do both, um, but I'll let you tell it. And why don't you give us your approach to equities and what your thinking is there? Okay. Um, well, let's, let's just sort of like get, – let's get the 500-pound gorilla out of the room. It's been a bull market, and I've been bullish certainly for the last 13 years. So that's true. And I would say there, there's an argue, argument that could be made that that it's sort of been a bull market throughout my investment career. So, you know, there's that. Um, one is uh, there's a basic notion that I have, like, I believe that you can make money in equities, and some people don't believe that. So I don't, you know, that that's a hurdle. And again, for a lot of professional traders, you know, because they think they're smart, you know, they, they think it's bullshit. So one is, let's just say, certainly over the last 13 or 14 years, I've done very well. Uh, but I also am a long term. I'm, I'm very lucky because I, I have my trading perspective and I have my investment perspective. And my investment pers- perspective is very long term. And when I buy a stock, I'm not thinking about next year or five years. Like my average holding period for a stock is probably 20 years. And when I say average, that means there are stocks I've owned for a lot longer than that. So in terms of equity trading as my approach is like I almost take a global macro approach to it. Excuse me. That, you know. I've done very well in what have been the growth stocks over the last last fifteen years because I don't look at them as like I don't I don't care what any analyst has to say like to me that any stock I buy is essentially a long call right and it's a long call in a macro market so rewind the clock I don't know fourteen fifteen years ago or and um, you know I see this company called Google, which I don't know anything about because I'm very low tech and it's trading up and down $25 a day. And so, so if I see a stock going up, up and down $25 a day, it's a high ball stock. 
And if I see that, it's like, it means like nobody knows what the right price is. Ah. So, you know, there's no price discovery there if the stock's going up and down $25 a day. So do I decide like search is a good thing that's interesting? Is search the Deutschmark um, in 1990? I don't know, maybe. So I buy that. And, um, you know, in terms of the growth stocks, I've done very well. Again, big bull market. I think you had to work hard to fuck it up. But I bought a lot of these things that I, I didn't really know much about, but I looked at them as all call on technology. You know, like I, technology was clear to me that was going to be very important. So I bought a lot of them. And um, what I do with stocks is I try to um, find like a sector that's sort of interesting to me that's a global macro se sector, for example. A better example is... And again, this is not a victory lap. I made a lot of money in PayPal and Square. And I've owned them. I didn't buy them an IPO. I didn't understand anything like that. But this is an interesting story. So I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's eight or nine years ago. Um, the backstory is like, this is an interesting backstory. So when I was growing up, there was a really rich guy in New York named Alfred Bloomingdale. He was a, a scion or scion, however you say, of the Bloomingdale family. And um, his claim to fame was he basically created the credit card industry. And he ended up like going out. He was a man about town in the 60s and the 70s. I mean, very rich guy, not Elon Musk. Bezos rich, but super rich guy. And eventually had like a lover, murder. Great story, you know, s and M. obviously a well-lived life, right? <laughs> but so, but what he discovered, what made him wealthy was he created, like he wanted to go out to dinner and all he, all this, his pals couldn't, um, couldn't, um, like why carry all that cash if you could create a diner's club? So, and it, on the club, you take a toll. And I like that. You take a toll. Every time you and a credit card is essentially, and he becomes like a, one of the grandfathers of the uh, the credit card business, and dies immensely wealthy. So that's I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago. I'm in Lower Manhattan going out for lunch, and I go into um, a cafe, and uh, they say there's it's cash only. It's no no excuse me, no cash card only, and there's a little square that you know, that's there. And it's like, oh, Alfred Blumenthal, 21st century. So I buy that. And I and again, because I don't know anything about fintech or anything like that, I buy that and I buy a PayPal. And it turns out that they're both turn out to be great, great calls. But I I look at stock trading as a global macro investor or a trader would. I'm essentially buying long calls on 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 stocks. And that's what I sort of do. And again, bull market. Listen, I bought Google. I probably bought the Ask Jeeves as well. <laughs> you know, which, you know, I, I, I don't get right. them all right. But, but they pay for they pay yeah. for it. And and and, and that right. is in essence, you are the quintessential long vol trader. Totally. And I and I realize that that's also part of the reason you do so well in times of chaos is because you're a yeah. long vol trader. You also are probably better at letting it run. You're not, you're not taking yes. profits like uh, Morris said, you know, you should take some profits. No, you let it run. How do you square the fact that all around you, you're hearing signs and, and worries about the economy is going to crash, the market's going to crash, blah, 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 blah. And even let's just take COVID. How do you square the fact that we had this COVID crisis, stocks went down, and we had all this panic are you just taking such a long-term per perspective that you just buy more? It's a very, it's a really terrific question because COVID was like a real sobering moment in that whatever the March of 2020. Um, it was, you know, I like to say that I'm a long-term investor and, you know, you know, these are, so 
in in the middle of this shit of whatever that was, March of 2020, I believe was, I looked at, and I was getting, you know, I had a long portfolio and I said, well, you know, these are the companies I own. These are the companies I want to own for the next five years. And for the most part, I said yes. And I knew some very, very smart people who puked, like very smart market people who puked their IRAs at the lows. And I just said, you know, and I will, I'll be very honest with you. It's like, I, it was a very, it was a little testy time for me, but, you know, you know, uh, and I wish to say like, oh, I bought a ton of stuff down there. I didn't, I bought some stuff. But just not selling you know, was good enough. Right. And I did buy yeah. some stuff. Like, I, you know, I always have like a list of, uh, of companies that are, I, I like to say, on my radar that I watch and I keep an eye on. And like, you know, I, I'm thinking about when and I buy it. And I, I don't try to time it. And like, you know, in the midst of COVID, I, ne- I didn't own any JP Morgan, but it was a stock that I've been watching for a long time. And I bought some, you know, and I bought some Disney as well, you know. And again, that doesn't make me smart or anything like that. But just like, I wish I would have bought more. I wasn't brave at all but i didn't sell anything because i said like are these the companies i want to own for the next five so can you tell me a little bit about the like jp morgan i can see it's long-term great company it's uh anytime you can buy that at a discount makes sense what was your thinking behind disney disney was like it was um my my kids are bigger big now you know my kids are grown up but it was very clear to me that this was when they had cut the dividend which i thought was a good idea like, like, Save cash. Yeah, it was like you know why pander to the dividend right. junkies, and the other thing was it was just when the um, uh, the subscription model was was coming up, and that seemed to be like a very good idea. And I figured like if I had kids, my kids are growing up, but if I had kids you know under the age of twelve or anything like that, like anybody who's got one hundred and fifty dollars of disposable income in America is buying Disney right. Plus. You know, that just, that was going to be easy. Plus COVID, the, 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 the um, parks are down. So, okay. The parks are going to come back up at some point, uh, whether it's a year from now or two years from now, that's going to happen. And it just was a, it was a macro play. It was like, okay, this is stock is really cheap. They're doing some good things. You know, you know, the, the other side of the Deutsche Mark trade is like, okay, you know, Good things probably can happen out of this for this company, and it's trading at a big discount. And the, you know, so I was wondering if you would share. Um, so Disney, uh, to some extent, that has been realized. You have another company that we talked about that's a little more. Let's say it's it's at that volatile point where they're still trying to discover, make some price discovery on it, and it's an insurance company, and it and it's and it's much different than previous insurance. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd love to hear your thinking about this because this is one that's almost playing out now as opposed to something that's already played out. Well, are you talking yes, about lemonade? Correct. Right. So, and full disclosure, I'm totally underwater on that stock, by the way. Um, but, you know, lemonade, you know, again, part of the reason I like that, it's a toll taking company, you know, like they collect premiums, you know, it's square, it's, it's diners club. I I like the notion of a company that they collect premiums, you know, there's a toll and someone's taking the toll. Uh, The other thing about lemonade is um, for, we're all, I don't know how old you are, but I'm like falling into the crotchety old man category. I got Um, there a little earlier. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm well there, you know. Um, so Lemonade is the kind of company that there's two things I like about it. One is um, their average um, user is like 35 years old. So you and me, we're not going to Lemonade. But, you know, my kids might go to Lemonade. And the other thing is like, and this is really, this is like global macro to the max. I don't know if you ever watch TV. But if you watch TV, the only people who advertise on TV, let's say on Law and Order, which is a program I like very much, it's you see Flo from Progressive, you see Limu Emu, you see you know Chris Paul, you see the dude from you know Whiplash, you know like what is, like these companies could could not be more stale, and that's who Lemonade's coming after. Like why are you why are you advertising on cable TV? Who the fuck is watching that stuff? Old, old people. And again, old people, right. 
And I think as an investor, if you're an old person like myself, um, you know, it pays to pay attention to what's next. And I think, you know, Google was what, what was what was what's next 20, you know, 15 years ago. And, um, you know, I think something like lemonade is what's next. I don't like using the word disruptor because I think it's stupid words like groovy. It's like, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but maybe you know, honestly, one second, maybe we start calling the stocks groovy. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah, exactly. But I like lemonade. I, I And again, full disclosure, I'm totally underwater. Right. I'm probably I just think it's a great water. example because like Google at the time, there was lots of people who said Google's overpriced. It's nuts. It's nuts. Uh, even I remember when uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Zuckerberg paid a billion dollars for Instagram. And we thought, oh, this is insane. I can't believe they just picked him off and, the, you know, that he paid a billion dollars. It ended up being the, the, the purchase that saved his company. Yeah, I mean, I would say also, um, you know, as a so-called market professional, you know, it, it's really worth paying attention to the the things that people hate. Yeah. You know, market professionals hate, like people like us, because you're, you may be missing what's next. Uh, and, um, you know, like I said, Google is something I, I participated in. Um, you know, I own, with the exception of, I own with the, I mean, with the exception of Netflix, you know, all the acronym stocks back in the day. And I, I worked with people who like, you know, I mean, Amazon was the most fucking hated company in the For world. For sure. Well, and then Mark Tesla took over the ma- and grabbed the mantle. Right. Right. But you're right. right. Before but Tesla new- took off to be the, the most hated, it was Amazon. For years, like, oh, well, they're never going to make any money. And again, I'm not saying this is a template, whatever, for success, but be mindful for things that people hate for no good reason, that people have a grudge with. You know, I always say, uh, both about it as a trader and as an investor, like, don't have a grudge with the market, you know, because back to what my, my, my pal said, like, market's always the market. The market doesn't give a shit about what your grudge right. is. Now, one of the things I'm curious to to uh, find out from you, uh, my understanding, I think that uh, I don't know if you told me or maybe more said it on this podcast. You have actually trimmed some things lately, a little more so than than in. Yes, past. yes, I have. I have. Um, I've started probably going into the end of um, 2020. We were 2021, like since uh, December 2020. To now, uh, I actually have sold a lot of stock, and not because it's my, a market call, but you know, I'm 62 years old, and um, you know, I don't have 40 years to make this back okay. again. So it, it is not uh, a market I, call. You are not any more, con- or or are you more concerned about the market today than let's say in 2019? I mean, I'm only concerned about the market to the extent that um, we're probably in year 13 of what's traditionally a seven to nine year cycle. So this sort of doesn't make any sense. But as a long term investor, which is how I characterize myself, you know, I, I mean, I'm a long term investor. I hold, I mean, I hold stocks for a long time. Uh, my kids, you know, I, I help manage portfolios for my kids. They're in my 20s. I haven't fully invested. I, I'm 62. If if things t- turn and I'm not really allowed to say, well, I won't say things turn really badly. You know, I don't know if I have the timeline to make right. it back. But so, you know, but I'm still pretty invested, but much less so. I, I've, I've probably gone from 90% long equities uh, in December 2020, maybe, uh, to 60%. So that's that's meaningful. But that's not a market call. That's more a lifestyle call. Like, I want to drink good whiskey when I'm older. <laughs> And so do you, um, putting your trader hat back on, do you yes. worry, uh, and do you see any similarities to the, the periods of what, that you, that we went through where, where it was very volatile and it was, uh, you know, uh, a little hectic and, and was yeah. there, well, here's even a better question. Was there any signs that you could foresee any of those things? Was there any theme or was it just a function that you were always long vol looking for those kind of uh, events? Uh, I mean, what, you, what are you, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question you're talking about. Yeah. Right like, now, so, or... well, like going back, you, you, you mentioned how the, for example, 2008 was a good time for your, for your trading. 
Yeah. Did, was that a function of pre-positioning? Did you foresee that? Or was it you actually recognized signs that were occurring and you had lots of... Ch- I, I recognized signs that were okay. occurring. You know, I, you know, I, I mean, yes, I, yes, I, I mean, I, I, yes, I knew Lehman was going to go under. I knew Bear Stearns was going to go under. I knew people were over leveraged. I knew every day, you know, uh, I, I would talk to some of the people who covered me and they would have a pin. I said, but anything better today? No. So do I see that today? Yeah, that well, and, and then, and, and then back, to, well, yeah. So let's start with that. Do you see that today? You know, again, yes, I do. I, I do to the extent that I forget about stocks, which are, you know, whatever, you know, as, as, you know, famous hedge fund guy said, you know, timing's everything. You know, I think what's mostly important is, and again, this is a function of how I look at the charts, like I'm willing to get on your podcast and say that whatever that July 20th low was in 10-year yields, I think that matters. And I think everything starts from there. And um, if that's the low of what's been maybe, some would argue, a 40-year cycle in um, in interest rates, you know, uh, I'm willing to say that's important. How it plays out and the timing is hard, but I think that's important. And I think if interest rates start going up in, in um, you know, with some real vim and vigor, uh, you know, it's going to complicate things, complicate the currencies. Like, you know, for me, you know, I'm very friendly to the dollar here. I have been for, for a while because I, I think rates are going up. Now, how that ends up impacting the equity markets, I'm really not sure. You know, at some point it will. I don't know what the catalyst for that is. But, you know, again, if you look at the equity markets, you know, 13 years ago, it's a nine year cycle. You got rates that have been going down. May, you know, pick your point 40 years, eight years, 13 years. You know, I think that matters. So, okay. So, so Leslie, I, I realize that that's a little bit of an unfair question. And the reason it's unfair is because, uh, as is probably obvious, that to everyone listening is that you're talking about all these things in the past, working on all these desks and doing all these things. You have almost had another stage of your life. You are there. Oh. I would love to hear the story of that other stage and tell us what you are very kind, Kevin. You are, you're a very kind. <laughs> no, I, I listen. I think it's important. I think it's terrific. I think it's a great story. You got to tell the whole thing. Oh, uh, you know, the whole thing's too long, but I will give you, so I work currently, um, I, I still am involved in the markets. I have my my pen pals who I talk to about the markets. I get up at five o'clock in the morning. I spend a couple of hours in the morning looking at the markets. I usually have a little bit of you know speculative risk on, you know, not a lot. I'm not trading every day, but you know, I will have a view expressed in the markets. And, you know, and again, I, I do watch, the, you know, my equity portfolios pretty closely. I don't trade them very actively at all, but I do watch them. And um uh, but I work as an executive oh, wait, coach. One second. Can we and, back up? Cause I'd love to hear yeah. about when you, when you, when you semi retired and what you did. I love it. I love the story. It's funny. It's, it seems uh, so New York. It just seems like a terrific story. Okay. It's, okay. it's a good story. So, I, and I, I, so I'm like living in lower Manhattan doing and, the reverse uh, commute to Greenwich. Right. Right. But then I'm sort of done. I'm sort of done managing money for other people. And yeah, I've been doing that for 17 years and, you know, managing money for other people. And then I go home and, you know, I'm working from home, manage my own account, probably trading too much, like thinking that I I still know what I'm doing. And, um, you know, I'm pretty pissy in general and no fun to live with. And um, so I'm living in lower Manhattan and um, there's this restaurant that's going to open up. It seems like it's opening up for like a year at a time. And I walk by and I go back to like, you know, I, I, I tell my wife who I adore, you know, like, you know, I'm going to go work there one day. So they, they, again, they put up the graphics, the graphics on the restaurant are much nicer than anything I've ever seen. It takes like a year and a half for the restaurant to open it. And we walk by there all the time to go to the subway when I go to the gym and I like tell you, you know, I'm going to bag it all. I'm going to go work there. And like, she's like, sure, whatever. And uh, so uh, I'm sort of not loving life trading at home, whatever. And so one day I walk by and there's a little crack in the door. So I go in there and I say, um, 
hey, uh, what's going on here? Like, um, whatever. And I say, listen, I don't know what's going on here. I know a lot about food, which I do. And I know a lot about customer service, which I do. And um, I get up, I've been getting up at five o'clock in the morning for the last, you know, 30 years. If you want someone to help out here in the mornings, I live a hundred yards away. I'm your guy. So they say, okay, send us an email. So I send them an email. They say, oh, come to a meeting, you know, like, like Tuesday afternoon. So I go to the meeting and like, lo and behold, they hire me. So I become like the morning guy in this little Danish cafe in lower Manhattan. And I go in, I go in at six o'clock, get up at five, you know, look at the markets, uh, go in at six, bake the bread, make some rolls, make some pastry, which I'm capable of doing. And then at seven o'clock, I open it up and, you know, serve like little Danish sandwiches and whatever. And uh, again, I'll give you like the short version of this. So I'm there and between seven and 11, it's my place. I play my music. Nobody's there. It's just me. And then I work, I t- go home, walk the dog because I live a block away, come back, work through lunch, you know, 10 bar, whatever. I have my uh, iPad underneath with my interactive brokers screens underneath in case I need to do anything, which I don't mostly. So people start finding out that I'm down there and, um, you know, they start turning up like, uh, you know, hedge fund manager, like people I know from the industry, you know, hedge fund manager is blown up, you know, compliance officer who hates their lives, you know, um, uh, you know, guy for energy, uh, energy analyst on the, the sell side wants to go to the buy side and they start turning up and some judges start turning up because we're near the courts in lower Manhattan and they, they start turning up to like, talk to me. And, uh, You know, one day I look up and like there's eight people with Bloomberg's up, you know, at the bar in the morning having ham and cheese sandwiches waiting for their turn to talk to me. And um, it's a little bit like Lucy, you know, uh, in the penis thing, like five cents that psychiatrist has said. And I'm not you know, trained to do any of this, but, you know, I'm sort of giving them guidance and sort of helping them out, whatever. And one day, like I like, I realized that this is a real thing, and uh, I don't know what to do with it. And I uh, go, um, I like think about getting an MSW. And someone says to me, "This uh, actually a wife of a friend of mine says, like, have you ever looked into coaching?" So I, said, I don't know what. So I look into coaching, and uh, I um, I go through. I find that, of course, you know, the most expensive course has got to be the best course. So I go through this like one year training program and I get certified as, as an executive coach. And this is about eight or nine years ago. And, um, you know, I, then I become an executive coach and, you know, the, the timeline, there's a lot that happens in between that, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, at some point I go through this whole thing, kicking and screaming. And this woman says to me, uh, if you don't pursue this, you're wasting your life. Like no one's ever said anything like that to me wow. <laughs> ever. So, uh, and, um, you know, and then so I get certified and then uh, so like eight or nine years later now I'm an executive coach and I work with people both in the financial markets and elsewhere. And, uh, you know, it's a really, really exciting, very, very rewarding, you know, thing that I do. And that's sort of, you know, I'm happy to talk about it at length, but, you know, I work with options trading companies where I'm the in-house coach and I work with um various people within the organization. I work with a lot of senior leadership and information technology companies. I work with some lawyers. I work with some architects. Um, I do work with a couple of traders and stuff like that. Um, That's not a big part of what I do, but I do do that. I mean, people like that because I speak the lingua franca of that, but it's not, you know, it's not predominant within my practice. And, you know, I have a big, robust private practice and i i also work with uh like i said some big companies who bring me in to talk to senior leadership and it's that's that's fascinating now first of all i just the idea of this uh, you know high flying uh uh prop trader getting up opening the door and saying do you want someone to cook your bread in the morning I think that is the funniest it, it, story that I've ever heard. And it's so awesome because it, people don't it was, do it was, what they it, love. It was, it was, it was an unusual 
career. For sure. Turn, and it's, for sure. and I, I've always told people whenever I hear someone that's made an abrupt change in their lives, I always say, I've never met anyone that's gone and said, you know, like, uh, well, I'll give you an example. There was, a, I remember there was a woman that worked in, our, in, a, in the in at my prime broker, and she was there and she's doing fine, I guess. And and then all of a sudden she says, you know, uh, she says I'm quitting. It's been lovely working with you. And I asked her, what are you doing? And she says, well, I always really wanted to be a teacher, and I'm going to be a teacher. And I've I told her, and I and I tell anyone this, I've never met anybody who's made that sort of abrupt change, and regretted it. No, I mean, uh, no, I mean, it's, I, I would say for me per, personally, it's uniquely satisfying. And again, for, you know, let me just backtrack to how we started this podcast. Like I was a journeyman trader and I say that very proudly. And that means like, you know, we, we joked around earlier, like I wasn't Derek Jeter. I was Scott Brocious. Like I, I was in the show for a long time. I had a 30 year trading career. Um, I had a lot of good years. Um, and uh, made an all-star team here and there, but you know, I, I know who I was. I was a good, I was a good teammate. I was a good clubhouse person. I was very dependable, and as as a risk taker, I was never going to blow up. I was going to, I was always going to manage my risk really well. But the nice thing for me later in life, like I'm a great coach. Like I'm a fabulous coach and like I was a very good trader, but I'm much better at what I'm doing now. And I'm very, I consider myself very oh, lucky that's, to found that. Later that's awesome. And okay. So why don't you tell people um, about what's the name of the firm? How does it work? Like give us a kind well, of. I'm very, this, by the way, this, the, me being on this podcast is like such a departure. Like, I don't have a Facebook oh. account. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't talk to anybody. <laughs> now you're going like, to get everyone you know, to, well, the, unfortunately, you don't have you know, a, I don't have a website. Have, uh, like, there's nowhere to shut up, show up to buy uh, bread from you. I mean, it's basically like, you know, speakeasy coaching. Like, you need to have the password, you know, to get in. And most of my work is by referral. Uh, but, uh, you know, if anyone wants to find me, I'm on LinkedIn. I got to, you know, sort of explains what I'm up to. Uh, Leslie Harris, my firm is a... I think I went to an LLC, so I think I'm Leslie Harris Executive Coaching LLC, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm uh -huh. just me. You know, um, you know, if anyone that out there is interested, you know, just kind of ping me on, on LinkedIn. But it's 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 a very interesting life. Like today I spent, you know, a day um, talking to um, – or th this morning – talking to like a fairly brilliant like tech founder and you know figuring out what's going to be next for her and it's just very exciting and i have these very intimate excuse me relationships with you know very senior leaders at a lot of companies uh in a lot of different fields and some of them are finance and you know like i said some of them uh i'm in-house at at the firm and i talk to lots of people but you know more more interestingly i you know have these very one-on-one -on -one relationships with people which is really That's exciting now leslie i'm gonna spring the questions on you i did not give you a chance to prepare for them so we'll see how you do oh great uh, well, considering how long-winded I've been and you didn't interrupt me, you're like, it's pretty fair game. You're entitled to whatever you want to do. I didn't interrupt you because it was such it was such a captivating story. I didn't need to do anything. I didn't need to steer it. I just let it go. I just Very kind. Go. Very kind. Um, okay. So we'll start with your favorite investment book. Um, I think The First Market Wizards is pretty good. I think Reminiscence of a Stock Operator has sort of got a lot of juice in that. Um uh, and again, the thing about the first market wizards uh, book, the number one, uh, is like a lot. Like if you know Paul Jones at all, like he's refuted a lot of things he said in that book, which doesn't really matter. But that sort of book is sort of interesting. And reminiscences of a stock operator is pretty good. Okay, and then are great traders born or made? You know, I've heard you ask this question before, and I, I and I didn't prepare for it, but I thought it was a very interesting question. I would say this about it like i think we're all born with different traits let's say some people are musical you know some people have good voice can sing some people you know have perfect pitch which is just sort of you know the next level of being musical i think some people are born with a particular relationship to risk some people are risk averse and i i i'm not but that doesn't mean i don't i don't um go to casinos, I don't jump out of airplanes or anything like that. But I think the thing about 
risk is that some people are more comfortable with uncertainty than others. And I think to be a good trader, you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. I've known a couple of really brilliant traders who at different junctures basically said to me, that, just not to me personally, but in, in, in kind of, I don't know anything. And some of these guys were billionaires and some of these guys were just, you know, vol savants and stuff like that. And I think you have to be have some sort of comfort in the unknowing to be a good trader or a great trader. So I don't, and again, I think that's a personality trait. So I'm going to go with, again, I can't sing, but I'm pretty comfortable with risk. So I mm-hmm. think uh, people are born that way. I, I love that response, uh, that answer. That was a really great answer. Okay, I'm going to give you the new one. The new one is Byron Ween was very famous for. I his, know him. Uh, I love him. Yeah. Oh, so you, so you know him. So you know his uh, his year end. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, the surprises for those who don't know, it's a surprise that the market would assign a less than one third probability of happening, but that Byron, or in this case Leslie, believes there is more than a fifty fifty percent chance of happening within the next year. What would be your one Byron Wine in the next is year? In the next yeah, year. or if you want to change it, go ahead and change it. Well, if you want to say I, five I'm years. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, without pandering to the current environment. I, let's go back to, to um, the beginning of twenty. Uh, what are we in twenty twenty one? Is that where we're at? So yeah, we're twenty twenty one. So the beginning of twenty twenty one, the overwhelming notion was that the dollar was going to collapse or trade lower, and. As a someone who like I, I feel pretty comfortable saying like I, I I'm a I'm allowed to have an informed position uh, opinion. About You've earned it. You're already. allowed to talk about currency. Right. Yeah, maybe not a lot, but that for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and throughout the year, I've thought like I didn't get it. Like I haven't traded the dollar pretty much uh, until a little bit in the last you know quarter, and not very much. But this notion that the dollar had to go down a lot. I just didn't get it. I was like agnostic about it. I didn't didn't care one way or another. And it just didn't make any sense. And I would say that um, something that people don't expect to happen that could happen. And again, I think people are sort of like in the last, you know, two weeks, maybe have changed their mind. I think the dollar could rally like a motherfucker. And I don't think anyone's expected to. Expecting that. that that's a great one. That's a great one. And we'll, we'll do the final one. And especially good coming from you because you're a coach. If you uh, were g- giving an advice to or advice to a young person that's interested in getting into our business, what would you tell them? Oh, it's a good question. I would say if you want to be a trader, which I assume this is what where this is going, or investor or portfolio manager, you can do. If you want to give advice to the all three or, okay. or just group, or I whatever think you, like. you know. I'm gonna. Give the advice and then give another comment. I think the thing about both being a trader, a speculator, or an investor, which are all three the sort of the same, I think the thing that's really required more than anything else is patience. And um, I didn't have a lot of that as a young trader. I wish I did. It took me a, a while. And when I say patience, like, I'm going to give you a metaphor. Like I, I don't, my kids are surfers. I'm a terrible surfer. I surf a little bit because I like to be splashing around in the waves with them. I don't do it very much. I'm going to start doing it some more, but if you're ever out in the, in the waves, in the waves, you see the good surfers, they just sit in there waiting and they're not waiting for like, they're looking out over the horizon and they're looking for like a good set to come in and they're waiting for their set. So guys like me as a surfer, like we're splashing around, chasing all these shitty waves. And the good guys, they're not wasting any energy around that. And um, I think like you got to just wait for your opportunities and don't don't flail around on, you know, in marginal trades or caught up in whatever. And I think that's a, you know, I think patience – People used to like to say, like, oh, discipline, you got to be disciplined. Like, you don't have to be disciplined because, you know, if you're undisciplined, like, like you're a bad de- demolition, uh, undisciplined demolitions expert, you know, it's like, you're going to just like, don't worry. Market, if you're undisciplined, the market's going to take care of you. But, um, you know, but if you're patient, it's like, be patient with yourself. And I would say, if you're, you know, professionally, which is something I wasn't, be patient with your career. Like, let things fall down. Don't be in such a hurry, you know? Uh, yeah. 
I, I can sympathize with that. When you're young and you're sitting on a desk and you just feel like I got to make the next step, I got to make the next step, and you don't realize that that time moves a lot slower than you ever imagined. Correct, and, and you know the market's like, you know, there's always another trade like that. And uh, you, when you're a kid or not a kid, but when you're younger, you just you think you got to like there's stick around, you know, stick yeah. around, don't blow up, stick around. There's another trade coming. Leslie, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll thank more. Uh, you know, thank Morris for introducing us because uh, it's it's uh, been a real eye opening, wonderful experience chatting with you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. This is sort of like uh, you know, uh, very atypical for the way I, I sort of live my life. So I, I welcome the opportunity to do something different. So thank uh. you very much. Well, you know what? Morris said the same thing, and next thing you know, he's got his own podcast. I know, so I, know. I, I expect you to have one within six months. As well. uh, very <laughs> unlikely, but thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. I, I hope this turned out okay. It was fun for me. It was. Let me just tell you, I had a lot of trepidation coming into this, and it was much more fun than I thought it would be. Oh, well, that's, thank you for your time. All right, Patrick, it's time for Talking Charts. What have you got in store for us today? All right. Well, before we get to the chart charts, let's talk about the top three things we were watching last week. Um, we were uh, uh, last week watching for a potential breakout in small caps. And, well, they certainly did break out. And, and they also have actually held the gains. I mean, a little bit of a pullback with the whole market. But overall, there was a, a, an extended almost uh, like nine-month sideways consolidation. in, in it, And we have a definitive bull breakout uh, small caps do look bullish, and so far they're holding the gain. So, uh, so that also we were watching the gold, whether gold and silver would break out. Did it? I'm, I'm, I wasn't looking at the charts, Kev. <laughs> well, it it definitely broke out in euros terms. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, when you look at the chart, like uh, we definitely had a, a big breakout in gold. Uh, it, it broke out of a, a multi-month range uh, to the upside. Uh, I'm certainly uh, watching next week whether the gains are held. Uh, always uh, the most important thing on a, a key breakout of a range is to see that the bulls are following through with buying and that it isn't a prairie dog of some sort, that it was a fake out. And so uh, as long as um, old dips are being bought and, the con uh, and everything's being well consolidated up here, then uh, that's a pretty decisive bull signal. I, I will uh, quote the Don Cox line. Those who know it best love it least because they've been burned the worst. And this, even though it's behaving well, I see lots of skepticism out there. And that only I, I, I channel my uh, the Lord Vader's uh, emperor and I say, bring it on. Let the hate flow through. You. <laughs> there you go. Now let's talk about uh, some uh, hot inflation numbers. Oh, hot is not the word. But what's the word then? Well, it's it's like, I guess I don't know. What's what's hotter than hot? Uh, super hot. <laughs> you can't just do that. <laughs> you can't just put super in front of it. <laughs> Either way, okay. So super hot inflation numbers. It's just scorching. Uh, maybe Jack Dorsey's right. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, no. What's interesting is is that still. Um, not really moving crazy in the bond markets on the long end. I mean, we did see some reaction, and certainly uh, uh, the inflation expectations uh, on the long bonds did pop. Uh, well, and even more so, Patrick, we had a screaming at the front end of the inflation swaps curve and in the break-evens. And yeah. that's where you saw most of the move was at that front end. Yeah. And, and, and it was definitely lots of moves there. I think we had new high all-time highs in fives and tens. Yeah, or highs for this move at least. I'm not sure if it's all time highs. It's uh, it's not over yet. It's uh, it's it's still happening. All right, so let's talk about the top three things to watch next week. And um, well, we, I had to do it. Uh, will traders buy the dip on Tesla? So the um, 
obviously we had that parabolic rise. We, we uh, kind of uh, highlighted it in, um, I don't know, it was last week or the week before, but we were talking about when these parabolic rises, inevitably the certainty is ex- extreme volatility, both to upside and downside. Right. And, um, and we certainly got uh, a, quite a negative reaction off, the, off of the, it, it pretty much traded up to about 1250 and then uh, has, has rejected its trading right now about the thousand level. Now, what we have seen in the past is that as soon as a dip like this happens, buy and dip traders scoop it up, and uh, and so one well, you know to put it at a more on a positive spin versus a negative one, it'd be really interesting to see whether the bulls defend the line here or whether the sellers truly uh, have uh, Eiffel towered this. <laughs> Eiffel towered it. That that is um, kind of Mark Spiegel's uh, dream. Uh, <laughs> I would say he's though, probably already been squeezed out of his shorts, right? I uh, know. Like, I think Mark, he's pretty tough guy. He's a tough nugget. I, I'd be surprised if he didn't have a, a core. It's, it's probably just, you know, a function of he's mandated to have that in his fund. <laughs> 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 I would say though, Patrick, one of the things that is different here, there's a lot of extra stock coming at these uh, dip buyers. Whereas in the yeah. past, we didn't have an increase in terms of the publicly available stock. Now, all of a sudden, we have all of Musk stock. And to top it all off, we have Rivian, which is Jeff Bezos' uh, backed uh, electric car company, also vying for the attention of uh, the EV dollar out there. Right. So although uh, I am loath to say this because every time I see uh, anything negative about Tesla, it just keeps rocketing higher. I think that they're gonna the dip buyers are gonna have more trouble than they haven't had in the past. Well, that's the thing to watch next week. So, uh, number two, uh, can the U.S. dollar and gold continue to rally together? So Patrick uh, really wanted to get the U.S. dollar in there, so we let him, but we just had, <laughs> we, we, we made sure that we put gold in there as well. It is I won't lie. That was, thank you. I, I really do appreciate you yeah. giving me the opportunity. Uh, and, and to be fair, <laughs> you always love the U.S. dollar in there, and it's 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 getting to the point where you probably should be paying attention to it now. And I'm not trying to say that the U.S. dollar is going to go up higher. Bandwagon hoppers. Take off. Bandwagon no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying not you. I'm saying everyone that was uh, just not watching it's, it it's, now. It's moving now to the point where you want to say, okay, it's no longer just noise. It, it might have a little bit of legs. And if it were to accelerate from here, w- you know, would that be negative for the stock market and, and cause all sorts of problems? But yeah. what is really interesting is that the it's managing to do this and gold's managing to go up at the same time, which means the gold in other currencies rising even more quickly. Yes. And, and uh, it is a, a really interesting observation. Uh, be, uh, I, I argued one of the reasons why gold did struggle so much over the last six to nine months generally has been dollar related. And, um, and the fact now that gold is rallying while the U.S. dollar is rallying is, is certainly um, an interesting observation. And, uh, and maybe it does continue. Uh, it's it's uh, certainly uh, worthwhile to watch and see whether the trend continues. Do you, I do. You, I think it will. Do you think it will? You don't I think the other it? thing about the U.S. dollar is that it's difficult because the euro is such a b- large portion of the index of the and one the, that we watch. Yeah, and the euro is definitely like just. Sucking like, wind, like it's, it it's is, like me uh, trying to keep up with my son running. Yeah, uh, my just, my. Uh, my uh, downside targets uh, are down to about this 113 level. So we're not that far from where I think the uh, the short-term support might come in on the euro. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're right. It's The euro has been awful. And obviously, with, it's more than 50% trade weighted into that dollar index. So that's truly where uh, that dollar strength is coming from. Anyway, number one. The China-U.S. summit coming up next week, right? Right. I, I think it's a virtual summit, but Biden is going to talk with Xi. I, I would say that if we rewind a month ago, was it a month ago we had Evergrande problems? Mm-hmm. And though everyone was talking about how this was the end of the world and all this could cause all this contagion, yada, yada, yada. Even today, I still get all the China bears sending me their doom porn about how it's all ending and things like that. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting, Patrick, if we had a surprise positive announcement and a making up with uh, Biden and Xi? And can you imagine the ripper that we would have? And we already yeah. saw, first of all, I, I think that some of the copper strength 
was it coincided with them easing restrictions on the real estate in China. And the copper reacted. And I think this is on something to watch because if it ends up being a, a nothing burger and they don't, they just, you know, exchange pleasantries, that's fine. The market's not expecting anything else. But yeah. if there was a surprise and they did all of a sudden announce that that went well and they're making up, I think we could get a lot of things ripping. Well, let me just show two quick China charts. Uh, this is the um, K Web, which is that uh, Crane uh, China Internet ETF. Yep. And while I don't, it's definitely not an uptrend yet. It has certainly stopped going down, uh, and um, it's a, it's really basing. Uh, whether you want to start uh, cookie cuttering a double bottom or some other pattern, it's uh, no longer making lower lows. It's, it's no base- longer consolidating downward. It's not consolidating <laughs> downward anymore. The uh, and and so uh, you know what I love saying that like you know you guys can bust my balls on it, but you know what's the problem is is that when you use terms like uh, a, a, um, a correction, it triggers people to want to sell and to get out. Uh, by saying downwards consolidation is implying that the primary uptrend is there and that you shouldn't necessarily sell because it's consolidating. Okay. And so that's the way that I word it to kind of not spook people out because the moment you start using Oh, it's correcting. Then everyone's like, "I gotta sell, right?" Okay. I no, like it. is that is not is that not a good? Uh, way I, I, uh, sure, it's it's good. Whatever get uh, gets you through the night, bud. All right. <laughs> and so, but but the interesting thing here as well, I wanted to highlight. So when you look at the China uh, the China A fifty, uh, it's also uh, creating a pretty solid base. And uh, it didn't make a lower low trying to turn up. I don't know whether you want to call it your cup and handle formation, uh, but it'll be interesting whether the China summit breaks these out. Uh, I am cautiously optimistic. Well, let's keep an eye on it. Uh, the um, So uh, let's talk some charts. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to highlight was um, obviously bonds are just in a, a confused mess, right? And you, you had a whole piece on that, right? That's right. Uh, and uh, so let's just start with like a, a five-year uh, yield uh, using Coifin here. And um, you can see five-year yields keep pressing higher. They're working. And finally, we're seeing that this has started to pressure uh, corporates and particularly junk bonds, which uh, you, you were highlighting that the duration uh, on most junk bonds are in that kind of uh, three to five-year window. And so as, uh, as the pressure comes in the middle of that, um, uh, uh, that curve, that's where we're starting to see pressure inevitably uh, um, start to show on some of these uh, junk bonds. Right. So people need to understand that junk bonds can go down for two reasons. They can go down because interest rates are going up at that part of the curve, or they can go down because of what is called option adjusted spread, meaning the credit portion of the junk junk bond index is widening. Right. Right. And so what's interesting is that both of them are kind of rolling over under a little bit of pressure. But to exactly your point, like when we look here, um, and this is an amazing feature of Coifin, you could go to the the corporate credit section. I'm just going to highlight here the U.S. high yield uh, um, bonds broad. So rather than going to the the triple C's or B's or something like this. Uh, And what I want to do is just look at that option adjusted spread. I didn't know that you could do that. That's that's nifty. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and um, and so you could look at all of these different things, and it's free. This is like a, a, a it's amazing feature. But if you look here, like um, even on a ten year history, we've been at the lowest credit spread uh, in um, in a decade. And uh, and the interesting part about that is that even though we're seeing a little bit of pressure on those bonds coming because of the uh, the yields on on um, Treasury, it's not coming from the credit spreads at all. There's none. There's, uh, there's no. None. There's no problems at all on the credit side. Yeah, they li- like literally the credit markets are worried about nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> they, nothing. It's uh, but uh, it is interesting uh, to see. Hey, wait, before the... you do anything else, though, Patrick, I see that I'm I'm looking at the screen here, and it also has total return. And one of the things that too often people, when they look at charts, they'll look at like the junk index or like the junk ETF, and they won't incorporate the total return. And on a lot of these products, that carry ends up being really important. 
And it's yeah. nice to see in Koi Fin that he's put it right in there so that when you're looking at the returns, you're looking at them as the, the total adjusted. return. Like yeah. our buddy there, Alex Gurovich, he talks about this all the time, about how everyone sits around looking at yields, but they don't realize that that yield, for example, if you're short that bond, you're paying out the, the coupon. And you're, or whatever, not the coupon, you're paying out the yield on that bond. And so you need to look at the total return on that product as opposed to just the nominal price. Yeah. And so anyway, that's great, great feature. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, uh, just uh, highlighting a couple other interesting things, let's talk about the VIX for a moment. And it's interesting that uh, really we did have a little bit of spike of volatility during the downwards consolidation, right, Kev? Uh, the, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> The um, but it, it, you could see yields come. Uh, sorry, the uh, the volatility coming right down to the bottom of the range. Like uh, right now, the market is very complacent. But you know what? I'm still shocked about is that we haven't returned to the pre 2020 COVID crash um, lows. Like uh, we were down in you know volatility even for years. We were in volatility in the 10 to 13 percent ranges, and we seem to be sticky at 15. I'm not uh, surprised. I've argued uh, this for a while. 1998 and 1999 were some of the largest increases at the Na- in the NASDAQ's history, yet volatility was much higher. It yeah. doesn't always – higher stocks does not always mean lower vol. And I've been, I've been banging that drum forever, and I'll continue to bang that drum. Right. All right. So uh, you know what? Let's, let's leave it at that. We've got a, a full show, but that's, uh, that's uh, our talking charts for the day. Let's go on. All right, Patrick, time for another skin in the game, and I lose another one. I clipped you, buddy. You did. And you got me on the stupid asset that shall not be named, which I probably don't think straight on, and good for you. Well, this is, this is the thing is, is that you, I, I have to clip you on your biases, right? Yeah, like, that's yeah, true. It's, like, a, it's, like, a, uh, like a well, you know, uh, like, like, a, like a hunter that goes after the weakness. Yeah. That finds it's, the squirrel when he's out trying to find the nut. <laughs> I heard Lita <laughs> laughing, I think. Uh, right. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, I right. lost the thing. It was, uh, And I lost spectacularly. I think I had lost, you know, because like the asset that one. shall be not named literally trades 24 hours all weekend long because you want to access your wealth on the weekend. And um, I, I think by, like, Saturday morning, I was offside by three grand. Wow. It was ugly. It was well done. I just got absolutely hammered. Uh, I would bet that uh, Bitcoin would close down, and now Patrick has a chance to do it again. So before we do that, let me just tell everyone about Skin in the Game. Yeah. It's our weekly opportunity for us to, do, to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle in full, and uh, by the next episode, I'm messing up there. And the currency for the wagers is as follows. A Duke and Duke, which is a crisp $1 American bur- bill. A pint of beer, a burger bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, two for a bottle of wine, which I have now lost two of. In a row. The, the, yeah, in a row. Yeah. And I don't you dare I, deliver I me. I should have known. That was me doubling up and like just, you know, adding to a loser and, you know, doing the doubling yeah. of the position. That was that was all emotion. Poor, poor um, trade management there, I would say. And right. you as a good partner just picked me off. Well done. Um, steak dinner, which is the grand big kahuna. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. All wagers settle in full, and there will be no netting of the positions. Okay, so Patrick, I'm what have you bet. got planned for me? Uh, we're gonna. Uh, there's a reason I didn't talk about it in talking charts. <laughs> crude, uh, crude oil. Ah, crude oil. Now I intentionally put it onto a weekly chart. We're looking at the December 2021 uh, contract. Okay, right, and. <clears throat> Right now, if you go and look at the last five, six, seven weeks, the average high-low range has oh. been more or less, yeah, sometimes under $5. There was uh, last week a $6 range. This week it was $5.19. I mean, more or less the weekly ranges are just a give or take around five. I'm going to give you a simple bet. Will next week's uh, high-low range be greater or, uh, uh, than this week's? So oh, this greater. week it was five. Greater, greater. greater. I don't even need All right. to think about it. It's five dollars and nineteen cents is the okay. number. And we're using this contract. We'll use the, uh, the December. The December contract, high low range for next week. Uh is it above five dollars and nineteen cents? So I actually feel really good about this one, Patrick. 
uh, but I, I have to institute some trade discipline. I really want to say another bottle of wine, but I fear I'm going to just make a fool of myself. So I'm going to go as high as a pitcher only. Which you know means that that's probably going to work. I'm probably going to be right. The fact that I wouldn't bet big. You know what? I don't know. Like, uh, oh, you don't even uh, want to do a pitcher. You want? No, no. You know what? We never do a Duke and Duke. I, I, I haven't had a crisp one dollar bill. Oh in a my long god! Time. So you're going to cheap out on me, and you're going to do a Duke and Duke? Well, I'm just, I'm just suggesting this because, like, I, I have so many outstanding burgers, and you okay, never. So I'll tell you what, Duke and Duke in some ways is even better. Because it's going to be it's for pure pride. I'm doing it. Pure a, pride. You're on for Duke and Duke. <laughs> All right. That's, that's <laughs> what I want to hear. Okay. So let's go on. It's time for uh, no stupid questions, only stupid answers. So uh, Lena, hop on and help us out with this. <laughs> okay. So first question here. Hello. I thoroughly enjoy listening to your podcast each, each week. As the original first commenter on your YouTube videos, I pride myself on my number one fan credentials. Mm. My question is as follows. I am in a position to buy a small business with the help of an SBA loan. The loan has an adjustable interest rate based on LIBOR. The deal seems great at the current loan payments, but a doubling or tripling of the payments could really throw off my future cash flows. I originally thought yep. about using PFIX or IVOL as a hedge, but those are curve steepeners rather than a short-term rate hedges. Is there anything a retail investor could use to hedge short-term interest rates on a 10-year loan? If so, what product would you recommend looking into? Appreciate all you do. So this is a great question, and the listener is completely correct. PFIX and IVOL are not good hedges for that uh, that loan. But yet what's great about this is that it's based upon LIBOR. And LIBOR is basically what euro dollar futures well not basically it is what euro dollar futures settle into meaning that those futures that we trade the euro dollars for the short-term interest rates are the futures uh sorry the libor minus rate minus 100 for each contract so if they were wanted to hedge their risk what they would do is they would short a series of euro dollar contracts from now until the loan ends and i don't know how the loan if it's just if it's you have to make sure it's on a mortgage and it's not reducing in its principal but assuming it's not it's just straight upwards you would just go and say i'm going to go and short every contract from now for the next 10 years to uh hedge my risk in the, in, in that trade depending on how your LIBOR is calculated, meaning what day it was, but that trade could theoretically be the perfect hedge uh, for that loan. Obviously, you should go check it out, figure it out, all the details, but long and short of it is go look at Euro dollar futures because Euro dollar futures are what you need um, to hedge that exposure. If it ends up being that the loan isn't big enough for the contract size, you should look. I think there are smaller ones, and then you could also approximate and do every fourth contract and, and do not so you don't have to do each one and make the notional smaller. So there is some learning. There is a learning curve for you to go to understand that. But that is your that is your contract that you want to go uh, investigate further. All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. Hello there. Can I send a question about Tesla and Musk? Probably I won't be the only one this week. Kevin retweeted a post about the Musk selling and exercising options in September, and so did Kimball and Company. Then we see the stock rising on a big squeeze, and then comes this poll last weekend. I wonder, how is all, all this even possible, and is it legal? I am sure too naive. Besides the usual rant on Musk, it would be nice to hear your thoughts on how this all technically works and the regulations around it. Thanks a lot, guys. It's criminal. <laughs> well, <laughs> listen, Musk is... Uh... Challenging some of the uh, the previous uh, goal goal lines that we've had or, or boundaries that we've previously had in terms of uh, what is legal, and what's not legal. I am sure that his lawyers just pulling out their hair every time they see him tweeting with all the things. And uh, if you look closely, I believe he did this tweet and then said something to the effect that he's going to abide by the tweet no matter what he had decided in terms of uh, whether he should sell his shares or not. Yet he'd already filed to sell them before the tweet ever went. 
And I guess maybe he doesn't have to follow through. I'm not sure. The long and short of it is Musk plays very, very fast and loose with the rules. And yeah. it wouldn't surprise me at some point if in the future him. that he gets uh, challenged by the SEC. He's already been in trouble with the SEC for the 420 tweet, you know, 420 funding secured. And so when you ask, how is this even legal? Well, the reality was that 420 tweet wasn't legal. Uh, it was, but the, but the thing about it is legal in what sense, meaning that he doesn't go to jail, he gets fined. And that's what yeah. happened with the 420 tweet. And maybe this will be another infraction. He'll get fined again. Uh, I, I wish I had some answers to you. I, I'm perplexed at him, how he uh, kind of convinces people that he is an underdog, yet he's the richest person in the world how he convinces people that he's selling stock uh, because uh, he wants to do it for the good of humanity, whereas the reality is he's got a, <laughs> a tax bill to pay next year anyway, so he had to sell stock. Um, I, I could go on and on, and I, I, nobody wants to hear me rant about Musk. Uh, he's definitely an interesting uh, fellow, and I think that uh, when you think about this question, let's see what happens a year or two, five years from now, and to see if it ends up being that he is, ends up not getting into trouble. I would be surprised if he makes it without getting uh, into some sort of trouble with the SEC going forward. All right. I like the answer. So, uh, Lena, last question. Last question. Huddle fam. First, thanks for all the knowledge and the laughs. Love the show. My question, I'm having trouble understanding Sprott Uranium Trust. Most securities entail some potential reward, com company profits with stocks, physical assets and commodity futures, defined payout in bonds, etc. Is there an equivalent for Sprott? If the U spot price is high enough, do they sell the physical for cash and pay shareholders? Could I have them deliver the physical uranium to my door? Thanks. Well, they certainly aren't going to be delivering physical uranium to people's doors. Uh, and so this is one of the big benefits of, of having it is it's, it's, uh, allows a retail investor to access uranium uh, outside of the, all the restrictions of, of the asset. Uh, but, I mean, it's a lot like uh, the GLD, right, Kev? Like, I mean, in the end, you own a physical asset, and you're, the, the goal of, of owning it is that the asset is a, a safe haven or you're making a, a speculation that the price of that underlying is going higher. So you're either using it as a trading vehicle or you're using it as a cash alternative. There's all sorts of purposes for it, right? It's not just about, you know, it paying a dividend or something like that. But certainly when, this, when it's trading above or below its, uh, its net asset value, certainly uh, it's within Sprott's uh, ability to collapse shares and, um, and buy back shares and do other things uh, to, to bring it back in line. Uh, is, am I getting, uh, you got it bang on. And I think that last point is the important point. Sprott has made this vehicle so that the investor has a uh, the ability to in, uh, own an asset that will track the price of uranium. And then in terms of how an investor realizes that, ultimately, the investor realizes it by selling it into the market. But ultimately, if we got into a situation where it was consistently trading below net asset value, you might see a situation where either Sprott just sells the uranium into the spot market and then pays everyone back the cash. Now, the trouble about that is that a lot of times the asset manager doesn't want to do that because the asset manager is getting paid on managing that asset. Uh, and that is one of the worries about a closed-end fund which is different than the GLD. And that's an important distinction is that a GLD, you can go and ask for your gold. You have to trade a, a big lot of it. You have to trade, I, I think it might be 50,000, uh, but there's what's called a creation unit for GLD. And if you ask for creation, you, you can go and then get the, the bars of delivered to you. And so that keeps the, uh, the price in line because if it were to go to too much of a discount, then Wall Street banks and hedge funds would go and buy the GLD and uh, sell the gold and earn the spread. The trouble about the, the Sprott product is that ultimately nobody can uh, narrow that discount uh, unless Sprott agrees to it. So that is one of, just the, the, one of the dangers of it. Hope that helps. Right, right. But the yeah. long and short of it is, <laughs> it makes sense. it's designed not to pay a dividend. It's it's designed to allow you to track uranium and for the investor to buy and sell 
uh, to gain exposure to uranium. All right. Lena, uh, (laughs) why don't you tell people where they can submit their questions? Please submit your questions for Kevin and Patrick to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. So thanks for tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Please give us a follow at the Market Huddle. We're there every day on Twitter. She gets tired of talking to Patrick and myself. That's Lena Manning, the, the helm on that one. You can listen to the Market Tune, Market Huddle on all the networks, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. And please, if you could, rate and rate, rate and review us on iTunes. You know why. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me at uh, bigpicturetrading.com and on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna. Kev, where can they find you? Uh, Kevin Muir on Twitter, or you can go check out my newsletter at themacrotours.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. And now stick around for the after show. <laughs> All right. Time to rate this beer, buddy. God. I was like stumbling with my words. I feel like it was this thing is affecting me more than I thought. Um, it's it's bad. It, it's bad. And the only thing that's going to keep it like from an absolutely terrible is that I love the logo. Oh, my God. You can't rate a beer just on a logo. Are you kidding? I can rate a beer for whatever reason I want. Oh, my and God. The color and the logo. Shame it, on you. I'm giving, Shame it, I'm on giving you. it a 5-1. It's just a, barely a passing grade. Ooh. Well, you know what? Uh, I've I've never uh, shied away from uh, fruity tasting beers because, like, I'll <laughs> you even have... try anything once. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the uh, but no, but like for instance, uh, ciders. Like you can get all the different flavors of ciders. I'm not opposed to these different things, but this is a lager, and it is incredibly sweet, almost like drinking pop. Um, it's uh, it, and just it. It's not what I want to be drinking when I'm drinking a beer. Like, I, otherwise, I'd be just drinking Coca-Cola the whole time. Like, uh, to me, this is way too sweet. Um, you know, we rated some of those other Alberta beers uh, pretty high or good scores. And I'm going to have to join you on this. I'm going to give it, a, a like, a 5.7. It's um, – I wouldn't buy it. Oh. I wouldn't buy it. saying a lot. Well, there we go. It's, okay. Uh, so what, are we, what else are we going to talk about here? What, any good shows lately? <laughs> Why do we all even ask Patrick? What have you been watching lately, Lee? <laughs> I'm I'm I finally decided to watch the season three of Succession. Oh, do you I like started. it so far? Oh, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. I love the way they talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> What's the big tall character's name again? Um Greg, is it Greg? I think so. I think is I he? I always get him confused with the tall guy from Veep. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. There's, they are. there's another tall guy on that yeah. show too, and they seem kind of like this. They could be interchangeable. Yeah, it's Craig. So Craig is yeah, the I funniest. So I was talking about how much I like Macaulay Culkin's brother. Yeah, because he's, <laughs> he's just funny. he's such a degenerate. Like it's just so bad. And then his he's sleeping with the the his oh, that older boss lady. I I think that's a funny uh, a funny kind of theme through the show. But then. I was chatting with a buddy the other day, and he's like, "But is it, but Greg's so good." And I was like, "Oh yeah, Greg is so good." And I was All thinking the characters about it. Are yeah. great. I mean, even like the first episode. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. The first, the for the third season or yeah. whatever, and in the beginning where uh, Brian Cox is getting into some sort of a van or whatever, going to their you know tarmac for their jet or whatever. And uh, Macaulay Culkin's brother, what's his real name? I don't know his first Kieran. name. Kieran. Is it Kieran? Have I yeah, got it right? I think. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. so. And he goes, oh, do you want me to ride with you? And do you remember Brian Cox's reply to that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's oh, like that saying that to his people. son. It's like, oh. Yeah, and then he just shuts the door. And I was like, oh, gosh, this show is so great. <laughs> So Patrick, I don't what know you... what you guys are talking. I know, about. poor Patrick. Oh, you have to see it. You'd probably like it, actually. Uh, yeah, 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 but he's gonna be too busy watching hockey. He'll watch it in ten years. He will watch it's... it in ten years and tell us how great yeah. it is. I was like, yeah. I'll be ten years from now. Like, man, there was this great show. Why didn't anyone ever tell me about it? <laughs> <laughs> so, what have you got planned for the weekend, Patrick? 
Oh, uh, just chilling. I've got a, a buddy who's uh, uh, moving back to Australia, and so we're, we're having a big uh, going away oh. uh, party for him tomorrow. So he's uh, been not allowed to go for the past couple of years, and they finally let him back home? No, he uh, came for one last, uh, like he's, he's been living back and forth for like a decade and, um, and he, ob- he got trapped uh, not being able to come to Canada for, during the lockdown. And, oh, then he okay. came, and then he came here uh, for the uh, last two, three months uh, to kind of wrap things up for, with what he has over here. And he's, uh, he's going to... He's saying like, ship the winter it. is coming, I'm out of here. Exactly. <laughs> he's, uh, I'm out of he's, here. Sh- he's, he's shipping out, and, uh, and so we're going to give him uh, a great goodbye. We're going to have a, a great party. Good reason to have some beers. Well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. I'm out of here, guys. Okay. Have a great time. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, everyone. yeah. Have a great weekend. <laughs> have a great weekend. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Everyone.